don't mean anything But thanks for listening yeah. Hello everybody and welcome to We Say Things episode 21 Sponsored by Fractal Design My name is Suns Fan, joined by Cinder and our very first guest Mr. No Tail himself. Yeah, only 21 weeks we No Tail Buddy <laughs> It only took you 21 <laughs> weeks to say yes, you piece of garbage. How's it going, buddy? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a weird time to be alive, uh, but things are things are very good. I can't really complain. You know, you're one of my favorite people ever, and I've said this many a time. Be- for I mean, this is before the Han days even. I mean, after the fact, you have always been on like our weird shows, like What the Horse... Uh, you were in the first two cap. You won the first two captains draft. If I'm not mistaken. You're always taking right. part in like this crazy ass shit, and I really, dude, you you are the best. All right, enough dick sucking though. Let's start the actual podcast. So <laughs> we've never had a a Sponsored guest before. Sponsored by Fractal Designs. Yes, thank. This is actually the final episode, literally, that Fractal is uh, sponsoring. <laughs> Good timing. But, they want to get out of here now. <laughs> uh, we want f- feedback from the viewers to and listeners on how we should be doing guest appearances because what we're going to do now is a short version of our normal podcast and I'm going to interview, or we're going to interview No Tail and let us know what you think. So the first topic of the week, boys, is Team Liquid forming their own org. There hasn't been a whole lot of information other than they're leaving Liquid. No Tail, I know you're pretty close with Kuroki. What you got, sure. buddy? <laughs> I mean, Spill it. I- <laughs> no, I mean, there's not there's not really too much to spill, I think. I think the statements did a good justice. I think it's like a, a pursuit kind of thing. Like, you, you, you want to, there's something that you want to do. I mean, I'm sure for Kuro, he's, uh, he's wanted to, to do it since Team Secret. I mean, there was a lot of, lot of energy and passion that was put into to Secret, and he ended up, you know, not having that, not having his own. Uh, I also think that they were very happy in, with their time in Liquid, but, you know, sometimes you just want to do stuff in life and and you go for it um yeah i don't have that much insight we we spent we spent most of our time talking about dota uh for ti uh, yeah yeah no surprise so it's it's 100 percent. is it 100 percent confirmed that they want to make their own org was that like in the wording of it that they're making their own stuff or was it just that it's not liquid anymore i think it was, i mean kind of doing their own thing that's yeah. kind of what i got from it but uh-huh. again i can't really I can't really confirm. I'm sure if <laughs> if somebody gives them a really good deal, I'm sure if somebody gives anybody a really really good deal, that there is they would take it. But well, this is a good uh, segue into another thing I want to talk about later, but we can touch on it now. The whole idea of player owned orgs, and then uh, this was my opinion. You're not going to like it, No Tail, even though you guys were the anomaly sure. in the situation. I feel like player owned orgs do not last long term unless they become hybrid or they win like every tournament, which is exactly what you guys did. Uh, you guys are a hybrid org, I'm guessing, right? With Red Bull, I'm assuming that's how it works. You don't have to. Uh, yeah, I mean, without going into too much specifics, uh, we, yeah. it's a partnership. It's a it's a very close partnership. We um, we work together on a lot of things. Um, we can ask each other of a lot of things. So it's a very it's a very healthy and and, and good one. Uh, as for how things are done, I mean, we we run we run our team. We run the org. Uh, they're our partner, so they're helping us with a lot. A lot of things, but nothing really org related. Uh, it's more like practical or sports related, like to the team. Uh, they're mm-hmm. always supportive. Um, but again, I, I think if we came knocking with anything, that they would help. We, we have we have a very good. Do you bond, get so. free Red Bull though? That's the real question. And can he hook <laughs> oh, someone uh, up by any chance? <laughs> Definitely, man. Anytime you need a Red Bull, I got I got plenty in the fridge. Oh. I'm always stocked up. Yo, off. we could uh, use a sponsorship for this <laughs> podcast. No tell. If, uh, <laughs> If you could hook you, hook us up with your boys I from could, Red I Bull. Could, I could throw that's Red the, Bulls all day, That's the man. real reason we invited you, buddy. We just want a Red yeah. Bull sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're just thirsty and you wanted a Red Bull. Huh? That's yeah, all you want me much. for. Oh, no. so, so this is a bit interesting to me because something I hear from a lot of players that they want in their teams when they have org support or whatever is they just want to focus on the game and do nothing else. Like They just want to play, show up for practice, and then have time off. And there's plenty of players that are like, it's great being in an org because then I don't have to worry about finance. I don't have to worry about infrastructure, planning boot camps, all this stuff. There's like managers taking care of it. How is it for you guys? Like how much do the players do compared to management? You have a management that helps with this stuff, right? Yeah, we have a management. Um, it's definitely understaffed. I mean, there's a lot to do. Even for one team, you, you definitely need staffing and it needs to be not just one or two people for it to, depending on the team, depending on the game, I'm sure. Um, 
but it's a it's a funny it's a funny business um to get back to what you're saying like the probably the reason why you want to do it is to have freedom it's not really i think the case at least you gotta be realistic with yourself because it it comes with a lot of work it's not going to really give Mm -hmm. you freedom in terms of your time what it can give you freedom to do is work with who you want and kind of work how you want you you might not have to do certain things that you don't like doing or work with sponsors that you don't want to be working with Um, i mean for example there are sponsors that i didn't want to work with just for ethical reasons uh stuff that i don't believe in um so that kind of freedom it gives you or it gives you know mm-hmm. it's also we have a very open uh team so we we can always talk about things uh things that people don't want to do or do want to do but everybody wants a salary everybody still wants to see see themselves in an org that gives them the boot camps that gives them a salary that gives them support when they need it um but yeah like i said it comes with a lot of work <laughs> to put it very crudely i think a lot of these player run organizations they happen for one reason uh one main reason and is that people don't want to get fucked in the ass so when when you see this happening is often because those people have been screwed over and they don't want to be screwed nobody wants to be screwed over and there's been a lot of that in esport so i think it's just a very natural response it was like i don't trust anybody i don't trust anybody to like mm-hmm. uh, enough to to work for or to have myself work for them or have them be my boss or, or uh, run the show behind so behind the game do, so how do you within a team like I mean, for you guys, it clearly works, right? But you can imagine if you make a player on org with other players, uh, how do you build that trust in each other that you feel like this could be run with us and we don't trust these orgs or whatnot, we think it's shady, but how do you have like this trust in each other that you just know, okay, we can 100% rely on each other to do it right? I, it's just to do it right. I mean, I think we're all ready to fail. I can definitely say that OG has not been run 100% optimally, far from it. Mm -hmm. Running a business is its own little game. And we are very tied up, uh, a lot of us, with you know the Dota part and we're understaffed when it comes to running the business part. So things could have definitely been done a lot better, faster, uh, maybe even a little bit different decision-making. But I think the decision-making has been overall healthy, good approach. At least when decision comes our way, we have to make, we try to make the right one. We try to be very uh, considerate and ethical and very honest. I think the main mm-hmm. thing is uh, open book and honesty. If you have that, it's uh, a lot healthier environment. It's a lot healthier to do business. Um, so, yeah, to answer your point, like how do we make it work? I think it's a lot about, yeah, transparency, open book, trusting people to then fill up, fill their responsibility because it's a lot of work. And, if, you know, just to give an example, if Honor tops us in a Dota game, they don't want somebody to come poke their shoulder and be like yo we're, we're talking about this now we're doing this no no they trust people to to do what's mm-hmm. best also in their interest um mm-hmm. yeah it's that's important to for people to feel like their interest is being taken care of and being um, taken into account and uh yeah and people then you can really do you, you can relax and play then a really functioning org might be able to offer um little more than what we can maybe offer in terms of certain things, as in you have a multi-gaming org that might have, you know, set up boot camps around the world, whereas we sometimes have to get a little exotic with where a boot camp is, even though it's mm-hmm. generally always good. Uh, we at least have that freedom that I do know that a lot of players in different orgs don't have, where their best interest is actually being taken care of, or right. a big part of it. I mean, yeah, we're trying to take care of everybody's interest. Sometimes it it's not 100% optimal, like I said, but that's the ethics are there, the morale is there, the yeah. intention is there. So that's what we really care about. The way that you, you guys are something? doing it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was sorry, just going to say, the way that you guys are doing it is like perfect to a T. It's, it almost feels like the Astralis of Dota in a lot of ways. Uh, mm-hmm. And a lot of like the original players in Dota that got screwed over, like you said, from other orgs. I don't know if that even happened to you personally, but I know oh, a lot yeah. of players that have gotten screwed over, like hardcore from orgs. And there was like this big trust issue early on in the Dota yeah. 2 scene, right? But when you take a player-run org that's successful and you maintain a majority of control at the very least, like 51, just to talk in business terms, majority share, then working with another org is not that big of a deal because you still have control at the end of the day. The problem is a lot of these player-run orgs, and you guys are not one of them, obviously, they don't last because the players try to do all the business themselves. And in a lot of cases, they're just not very good at it. They're just these young kids that just have no idea what's going on. Would you agree it's with that? game. Yeah, man, it's his yeah. own little world. It's his own Dota game. It's his own, and it's sometimes it's very strange. And sometimes, I mean, 
the game also changes and people play weird games when it comes to business. It becomes a very closed book kind of thing. Um, definitely been in organizations that weren't functioning or yeah, like at times they weren't functioning. And so that whole transparency level not just goes away, but becomes a big gap and like a big canyon. Um, that's when, yeah, you don't really, it's, your interest is not even a question. It's not even a topic, you know, it's, you're just, you're just there to uh, make the machine work. Um, yeah. So do you think the, the way you guys work with it and yeah, just the whole, the whole, ex, the, the whole experience for you and let's say the maturity of your players, do you feel like what you guys are doing is something that many teams could do? Or do you find it like a bit unique that you've been able to pull it off? Like, let's say you put together a European team of five good players. What do you need to run your own org? Do you need old players, experienced players, somebody with some sort of business education? Uh, if I had to be completely honest, because it's been a it's been a long project and mm -hmm. failures have happened. I mean, especially at the very beginning of OG, a lot of I Come say on. failures. Very beginning, you won two mistakes. majors, bro. Come on. Oh, yeah. Dota, Dota wise, <laughs> things have always been great, oh, right? But we're talking okay. the whole business game. Sure, sure, the sure. whole business game. Like when OG started, like uh, man, it's full of mistakes. Happy, happy little, happy little mistakes, right? But it, we had to trip a lot to learn the lessons of. What can be done better? What's the way to do things? What can be done right? What even is business? What are all the terms? Uh, what is it everybody's doing? And then you meet different types of ways of doing business as well. Um, I'm sure I have, a, I have. I mean, I have so much more to learn. It's not a world that I particularly care for so very much. I just, I just want something that feels nice and feels right. I don't want to mm -hmm. be taken advantage of. Um, yeah, I don't want to hear about all the money that's flying over your head and other people making it. Uh, it's not about making that money. It's about, yeah, like being a workhorse you, and not being told and not being, uh, yeah, not being taken, taken care of. Yeah. Control. Sure. If you, that's one way of just making sure that things are being taken care of is you mm -hmm. take control, but it's not really about taking control. I would have been just, I, I like, I don't think any of all, any of these player organizations might've happened, maybe one, but most of them would have never have happened if things were just being done right and fair. I think right. players would have just stayed in their orgs happy, peaceful. It's a good system. It's a good uh, ideology to have a multi-gaming org, pick up players, support them. Like if they're really big and successful, a, a person might be able to come with any any problem that they have that they need assistance with so they can focus on their game to apartment, taxation laws, you know, traveling around the world, even language schools. You know, you can have that incredible support system within a within a gaming organization if it's well-funded and run right. But for the most part, it's just a short-term money-making machine for people, or at least that's what they kind of treat it as. Uh, mm -hmm. Then esports is growing so much, and they're actually staying alive because of that, a lot of them. They're just staying alive because they're being pumped full of money um, by other people who are seeing esports grow. And yeah, it's not really being handled well, that money, mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, are you talking and, about Overwatch yeah. by any chance? Not <laughs> because what? that is all... No, actually, I actually have no idea. <laughs> oh my god! I have no god. idea about Overwatch, but that's okay. Blizzard. Blizzard has been messing <laughs> messing up big time in everything. I don't know oh. anything about Overwatch, so I can't talk about that. Dude, I'm they... just talking about you know Diablo three. <laughs> Dude, they fucked up on literally every. And that's a whole nother topic of conversation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, let's let's move on to because I don't want this to be like an eight hour episode because No Tail has some very important things to do. Of course, he's a busy man these days. Uh, the last topic the we'll talk about. We, get. we have ten minutes of sun in Denmark. <laughs> Making me miss it, oh, bro. I'm so Screw sorry, you. buddy. So you can take vitamin D pills. I got plenty on my desk, actually. Uh, you giving my, me the D? Thanks, Shannon. Yes, I can give you yes. a big D. So DPC season was announced since our last episode, Cinderwin. It were on the same dates yep. as Midas mode, and there were a ton of threads on Reddit, which, of course, we know Valve just lives off of Reddit. Uh, a ton of support for Midas mode, for Slacks in particular. Uh, some people even... This is not true, obviously. Some people said that Valve was sabotaging Midas mode as if they have a reason to do so. I don't know what the incentive would be there. So a few days later... Why is this obviously not true, Shannon? Tell me. What do you I know? Mean, I mean, I do know a little bit, but not as much as you would think. Nothing I can really talk about. But I, I think that my guess, and this is a guess, that a lot of the team didn't even know Midas mode was on those dates. That's my guess. Yeah, I uh, would agree with that. So a few days later, the Dota 2 Twitter comes out with the qualifiers for the first set of majors minors has been updated to accommodate for Midas mode. Updated dates yeah. are here. A LAN tournament was originally scheduled in the second week of, Octo of October, and we tried scheduling qualifiers around it, but the tournament has since been canceled. Have you guys... I, 
I'm trying to remember a time where this has happened. I can't in Dota 2. Uh, that Valve moved for the sake of a community tournament? Is that what you mean? I don't, yeah, yes. I don't think that ever happened. I Has it? cannot remember. Now, here's the question for you guys, and be honest. Mm -hmm. Do you think they would have done anything if Slacks was not involved? If it was this big and the community response was this big, I think so. Okay. But for me, it's also, would they, let's say, I mean, this is very <laughs> much speculation, right, at this point. Like, let's say... Uh, What's so funny? I explain this? Uh, I'm just playing it in my head. You know, a video of Slacks crying. You know, I think Val might have seen this coming. Where Val, like, Slacks going to get more and more desperate. And at the end, it's going to be just a video of Slacks fucking weeping, like crying his eyes out. And that's so what I was what... thinking. Uh, what I was thinking, Shannon, was what if uh, the original tournament that they said was moved, right? What if that mm -hmm. one was still in place? Would they then have moved the qualifiers or not? For this I don't know. Tournament. Yeah, right. Because, I, I mean, the way it's presented, it's also a really good way of, you know, whatever kind of mistake this was. If, like you said, some of the development team didn't know this tournament was happening, blah blah blah. Uh, it's a good way of, kind of, you know, acknowledging that Midas Mode is a big thing, but at the same time, it when you present it this way, it still kind of feels like Valve are in control. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. they have the argumentation: we are moving it because our tournament got moved. Right. It kind of sounds like you could interpret it that way. Like, don't try to boss us around with your second party tournaments because we're not going to do this every time if you have a big event. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's overthinking it a bit, but you know what I mean. I what you mean. Uh, yeah. I mean, that could be, that sounds like a very, very much like a Valve thing to, to do, you know, be, be the boss, wear the pants. I, I think maybe because Midas, Midas Mode was announced before, they did this out of mercy, you know, out of like mm. mercy for the tournament. But yeah, you never know, man. Um, yeah. I guess so, with their position, you kind of have to prioritize the DPC, right? Like you plan this for a long time. Tournaments have to apply for slots. And if you start being yeah. lenient a bit too much, it becomes this really difficult scheduling problem, right? Where they, at some point, they kind of just have to put their foot down and be like, these are the DPC dates. This is the, this is the year in Dota. This is what the players are going to care about. So you guys have to schedule around it. And maybe this time Midas Mode got a bit lucky, in a sense. Mm. Yeah, uh, I the, think so. With the qualifiers being, or with the other tournament being moved, fortunately, for them. You, Lil tweeted at uh, Slacks, I think. Or, <laughs> yes. or, oh, or yeah, I saw or, that. Yeah. About the boot camp, right? It's a valid yeah. point. Even though, you know, like, yeah. usually usually those things can change and stuff. It shouldn't be the biggest deal. But it, it can also, if it can't change, I mean, it's... It can also be a big deal. It can be a very real deal for for some people, some teams, somewhere, depending on your booking and how much money you have, and etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's it's not so professional to you know set the dates, change the dates. Right. Um, it's not hundred percent profe professional. Things are just generally not run hundred percent professionally, and I think it's a shame. I think there's a lot of reason for it to be moving faster in that direction. We have every tool. I I definitely do think that. Uh, so lack of initiative, both maybe also on the player side. You could definitely argue on the player side, but also on on Valve's side as a tournament uh, organizer. I mean, trying to run the DPC system, there should be a board in place for the DPC system, trying to improve it every year and actually running it, like going around, making sure that everything is optimized and everything is always done better and greater. Um, somebody who's actively going to reach out to the players and get input, talk about what can be done better, what, what, what's the general consensus. Um, I definitely think, so just one example is that there's no off-season in Dota, and I think you're going to see that next year, and it's happening through um, a lot of people who are taking some time off after TI, right. and I, I even remember it after TI, um, uh, TI8, the player meeting before the tournament started, and people, they were announcing the DPC system. People were already asking questions, like raising their hands. What about uh, the first major? When is it going to be? And they were really worried. And they heard that it was happening really fast. You know, there was yeah. two weeks after TI8 ended that the qualifier had to be played. Two or three weeks, if I remember correctly. That's that's crazy, man. People get really burned out. People tire themselves out. I don't know if it's the same in uh, American football or basketball when there's the off-seasons. If it's yes. because it's so intense and they do need a break. But Dota players really need a break. And... I think it's going to happen mm -hmm. through force rather than through conversation and foresight, which I think is a big bit of a shame because it, we all 
are communicated. Well, it, it it does start later than it did last time though. Last time was like two weeks. Yes. At, it was was it two was it even two weeks? I don't even think so. Almost it was like less last than year two was weeks. Insane. Like that yeah. was completely ridiculous. Like the this roster year, lock I think and all the first that. Qualifiers are in early October, which is arguably one month break, but it doesn't. I mean, you tell me, yeah. no tell, but it doesn't really feel like a one month break, right? Because you need to prepare going into the qualifiers. So you can't take a full month off and then just show up and be like, hey, let's go, you know? I mean, in Dota, you know how it is, right? Like, for the most part, when a new patch hits and you're going to that tournament, you're, you want to have a week or two under your belt before you start actually boot camping because it just, it's a big step. It's a big step to making your boot camp like uh, progressive and, 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 making people more knowledgeable about the meta and the patch and everything. So yeah, you know, you can't really just jump on the horse, like start playing the day the, the qualifier starts. You probably want to boot camp and then yeah. you probably want to play before the boot camp. So what are you actually left with again? I'm saying that there's with the way that Dota is being run and held and played and with the intensity that is being run at, people probably need a much longer break if this is what we're being asked to do especially around ti times i mean the three to four months of ti is insane man it's insane what at least we put ourselves through in terms of hard work and mm -hmm. i mean we love it but it burns us out like crazy so it's it's a big ask to um is that not a fair ask to have people play two weeks or even one month after yeah. ci and i mean it, it's like that in literally every sport and i think one maybe misconception is once people say i'm not I'm not going to be playing until, like some people have said, until the new year, like January. It doesn't mean they're not playing Dota. They're just not playing with a the team. They're not going through the actual grind. They're just playing for fun. Because I'm guessing you guys still just pub Dota, at least yeah, on yeah. occasion, yeah. right? We're playing. Yes, yes, on occasion, yeah. But you like, see, right now... I don't me, think... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sure. I, for me right now, it's max maximum relaxation. I'm also trying to, you know, bounce back in my health level. Like the two the two weeks after TI is all sleeping and eating for me, more or less. Like I I feel exhausted. Uh it was really insane last year, this year as well. My body shuts down and I I can feel I, I need to give myself that. I'm I'm dealing with all that tension, all that stress and my body just collapsed. I mean it's hotel food, there's no sleep and then it's a tournament and then, you know, we also go through all the stresses before that because we want to get to that major before TI to get as good as a grip of the meta as we can, the patch, blah, blah, blah. And it just, it's, a, it's a very long grind. It's a very, very long grind. I'd say in my, in my experience, so just from playing, I feel like most of the players that take a break or all of the teams after TI, maybe you don't see them in pubs for like a week or two, but then they slowly start trickling in and just playing. But that isn't the same, like you said, Shannon. It's not the same as playing competitively. It's a totally different beast, like how much yeah, energy... Yeah, it's just like basketball, you will take... Like, you get a three-month break, but yeah, it's not like they're not working time. out. They're they're in shape yeah. the whole summer, unless they're just really lazy. That's just how it is. Okay, um, so to finish off on this note, I have mm -hmm. one more question. Uh, or actually two, kind of. Uh, one is, the, the bigger one, is... Do you feel like most of the problems with the DPC that you talked about with with how it's run and planned, do you feel like if Valve could, let's say one year in advance, could announce all dates for the coming year, all qualifier dates, all event dates, both for the purpose of players preparing and sorting out boot camps well in advance, and for secondary organizers being able to dedicate slots, like so we avoid the situation where Midas Mode almost died. Like if they know one year in advance, these three weeks are locked for DPC, 100% do not touch do you think that would be the overall solution to all problems, or is that just a part of it? Ah, the more foresight, the better. I also mm -hmm. think that there's a limit to where, I mean, it stops making sense for everybody, right? You can't just make three seasons in advance, but having having the plan or the schedule six months in advance sounds like a pretty reasonable amount of time for people to start planning, especially if you want to have like a tier two, like a, like a tier two or tier one and a half tournament right after TI. Maybe there's teams who are even willing to to go to that some south american team that hadn't been in the four majors but then they managed to get to the last one get enough points get into ti they didn't play much dota throughout the season but they're ready to play right after they'd be ready and willing and then a lot of tier two teams would want to play that tournament people could schedule that you know before ti even began but right now it definitely seems like ti is just dictating the whole season and everybody's just yeah. waiting patiently looking at their clock like when is when is ti starting or ending or so we can start you know planning um definitely but I think it should get more professional. It, there's no reason for it not to be. And yeah, some more foresight. Okay. I... Um, and then the second question I had, Jen, really quick. Uh, 
if you could decide on the spot, if you could be like, this is how long of a player break we want, when do you think the first qualifier after TI should be? I would say having a three-month off-season scheduled, three to four, would make sense with what what the teams are being asked to do. Um, so the first qualifier is in November, basically. Or yeah. Late November. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, sound, that sounds like a reasonable amount of time, I, I think. Uh, it's more like the traveling is so intense. We travel all across the world. I don't know how it is in the other sports, but with that amount of traveling together with the boot camping, um, we spend so much time on the road and that is really draining. And, uh, yeah, yeah. there's no, <laughs> there's never been a br- break, break time throughout the year. Uh, a set one. I think based on the fact that a lot of you guys are not, are just not playing this season, next season, I will be shocked if they don't change it. Uh, cause like you said, you just kind of have to force it and then they'll, they'll adjust instead of having a conversation, which should have been to begin with, but you know, it kind of is what it is. It is what it is. So <laughs> I want to transition into Best conclusion the, on anything. into the, <laughs> it is what it hey, is, man. What you that, do? That's always correct though, isn't it? you can't be wrong by saying that. We should, uh, we should be running the town hall, man, having these meetings. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, it is it what is it what is. I'll tell you what. <laughs> All right. So what I want to do is kind of do a mini interview at, I just want to talk about your life in general. We'll go in kind of chronological order because I have some very interesting questions uh, that I think a lot of people would appreciate. First and foremost, where where did you grow up? What was your life early on? Like, were you always a gamer? Were you into like board games or anything? Like, were you active in terms of like, for example, I was, believe it or not, an athlete until I came upon Half-Life <laughs> 1 in Doubt. 1998. Doubt. All right, let me just, 52 points I scored in a basketball game in seventh grade. A year later, I got introduced to Half-Life. It was was not very long, actually, just a lunch break. But Half-Life 1 introduced me to obesity, uh, (laughs) pre-diabetes, and... You know, carpal tunnel syndrome. So, what was it like for you, No? Oh <laughs> shit, man! Oh shit! Well, I can I can bring you I can rewind even more and take you all the way back. So, I was apparently Please. made in Hawaii, according to my mom. Oh, uh, yeah. I know. I don't know why I know that, but I, I know that. So, I can share that with you as well. Is that a cultural uh, thing that you guys talk about that stuff? Because in America, that's just no. a bit eccentric, <laughs> but I, I like it. Um, that's hilarious. Yeah, no, I'm born born and raised in Denmark. Um, I was I was on the Game Boy first when I was on the pot, like doing potty mm-hmm. training. So I started very fucking early. Um, nice. Always been huge on video games my whole life. I, lo- I loved all video games. Played all the Nintendo 64 ones more or less. Uh, really big on Zelda, um, the Ocarina of Time one. Really set me off for a good start. I, I think I think it's something that most kids should play, like the Ocarina game. It's a uh, it's a puzzle. It's a very puzzle intense game. Very nice stories, right? Uh, and I think it's it's quite good for kids to 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 play a lot of these kind of games because it gives you confidence. It teaches you, you know, overcoming. It's an adventure, you know, with ups and downs, all that kind of stuff. So, and there's you know, you're playing a flute, music, music aspect to it. Uh, anyways, moving on. Played video games my whole life. Wait, were you for sorry? Days. Were you social during this time? Were you a social person? Uh, balanced it. I mean, I was definitely an introvert. Very introverted when I was a kid, super mm-hmm. introverted. But I had some friends that I opened up to. I was, I mean, I think most introverts they they really are waiting for the, their moment to open up. As soon as they meet somebody who they feel comfortable with, they start opening yeah. up. And I definitely had those people in my life as well. Uh, but definitely a big introvert. Uh, yeah, skipped school for net cafes growing up. Uh, these cyber cafes. We there was a big culture in Copenhagen for that. Um, stumbled upon one that was a Dota exclusive one more or less I tried my first Dota game some months before that maybe half a year um, but yeah ended up playing a lot of Dota 1 I played so much Dota 1 uh, land 5 versus 5 um, did you go straight to Dota and, and not do Warcraft 3 oh sorry yeah I skipped I skipped a lot of games okay so no I that's played. fine I was just just curious because some yeah, people yeah, I know good, just good. went straight to Dota you know no 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 I did I did the Warcraft 3 did the Warcraft 3 campaign played some um actual melee like one-on-ones i played a bit of starcraft played all the blizzard games campaign through and through Jablo one two sadly three um <laughs> the what else did i play i mean i played a lot of the other strategy games as well i mean uh, i've played heroes of might of magic i've played mm. i played basically all the classics half-life uh, one and two it's been a very long time though played a lot of counter-strike uh, this is all before dota 
Um, yeah, I played all those really weird random games. A lot of the weird random games. I mean, there's games, of course, I haven't played, but I've played a lot of games. Um, Every game yeah. in the world. No, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, oh, yeah, I got stuck with WoW as well. I got stuck with WoW before, though. Really? Oh, wow. shit. Yeah, I also played WoW during Dota a bit. Oh, my God, that game was so addictive. Uh, <laughs> I became really good. So this is a quick uh, quick thing. I mean, not, not everybody knows, but I was really freaking good at PvP. We had a really good 3-on-3 three three going on uh, in Burning Crusade when, we were do when Arena came out. We got the world's first hot, 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 and hot, hot, hot streak, the achievement oh. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember exactly what the cr credentials were, or the criteria, sorry, if it was like some 10 win streak with whatever. But yeah, we were owning it up. Uh, I was owning up in 2v2 and 3v3. We had really good groups. Um, really, really fun game. And then it kind of died out. I mean, there's a lot of the grinding part. I hated hated the grind. Uh, even though I love it, so I love you grinding. Went to Dota. <laughs> yeah. to avoid the grind. Uh, well, let, let me ask you a question before you continue. This is very. I always, I'm always interested in what people think because when I played Counter Strike professionally, super way back, and I started playing Dota, I actually yeah. felt. I don't know if it was placebo. I actually felt the more I played Dota, the worse I was actually getting at Counter Strike. Did you ever feel that way for a specific game that you're playing a different genre and you feel actively worse at the other one as a result? Do either of you feel that way for anything? I can relate. I can definitely relate. Uh, it, it was also WoW and Dota. Uh, yeah, it's like that whole habitual thing. You really get into it. But I think that diminishes the more you swap in between the two games. Hmm. I think if you swap in between a daily after some time, you can do both. Uh, yeah. It's a, I, I don't know. It's, it's also a hard question to answer, right? Because you could say, yes, I'm actively getting worse at Counter-Strike by playing Dota all day. But if you're comparing it to playing neither, <laughs> then you're probably also worse at Counter-Strike because you're not playing it, right? So right. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit hard to, like, how do you measure this? Exactly? Well, I, I lost more matches when I started playing Dota. Let's just say that in Counter-Strike. So, I, de so I definitely my... think when you get introduced to new games and you're used to one game, like this new game, it takes a lot of space in your brain. Like when you first mm -hmm. start playing a game, you can even dream about it. Like you do it enough, you get that Tetris syndrome where shit, yeah. man, like you're at the grocery store and now the game, like everything is dotted for you. And it, I think yeah, that initial thing, it takes over your whole life and it can also affect your game. But I think once you, right now I played so much Dota, I played so much freaking Dota. Uh, and I, I could, I could, I can go play a new game for a while, come back to Dota, and quickly get back into it, right? Mm -hmm. After some twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand hours, like, like overall, I'm, yeah, Dota is in there. Dota is mostly uh, what's in there. So continue. Sorry, you. So you start playing Dota and other games, and then what? Yeah, uh, Dota at, the, at that net cafe. Then I got introduced to Han as well down oh. at the net cafe. I, yeah, that we're gonna talk about Han this. Really yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's when Han really started. Um, became very much in love with the game when it first came out. It was mostly because I was really triggered by the Dota 1 lack of binds and um, the engine just wasn't 100% friendly towards Dota, right? Like the game developers, developers were working around it with how they're making the interface. I mean, they had a lot of freedom with the custom map maker, but I, I could still feel the limitation from, you know, my I had to use the arrow keys i couldn't rebind shit like I, I couldn't even get the items like i had to get the third uh, third party program to to make it happen everything was legacy keys i was so triggered by that like fucking like uh, I, yeah i know then, i agree because I'm, I'm all about efficiency on my keyboard right playing yeah. being a wild player with the macros and everything i was really efficient about all my my keyboard space like everything on my left was bound like a motherfucker man like everything did something and then in dota i had to click N or K to Omni slash like yeah it was N what the was fuck? <laughs> yeah Omni was on N I remember this oh my god it was so uh, wh whack dude it was so whack I could have played in Volca and everything but I couldn't in Dota one because of Legacy I was like really yeah. triggered so when Han came out I was in love wait I how was, was love very... how was Micro in Dota one like did you play Meepo in Dota one at all no 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 I didn't I did zero microing I never it never really spoke to me I did some strategy games and stuff but I never became that good like mm -hmm. RTS games like in, in Warcraft or Starcraft or um, Age of Empires or any like, I always fascinated me the base building aspect, but not the microing part. But no, 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 I didn't know microing. Uh, hell no. I mean, a lot of people uh, take is, for granted things bit... like uh, reconnecting to a game wasn't a thing in Warcraft three or in the it, Warcraft three exactly. engine. There's so many yeah, small that... things that you just don't take you take True. for granted these days. That was not a thing yeah. back then. Yeah, exactly. I find, I find it funny how. 
like this conversation is always fun when it comes to settings in Dota, like how differently pros approach it with like mouse speed or how they move their camera. There are some pro yeah. players, there's like one or two pro players that actually move camera with arrow keys, I think, still. Yes, And there yes, are people I that play so, with legacy yeah. keys. That's yeah, kinda, there are people that play with incredible. legacy. There's even people that do ac mouse acceleration, and I think they should be shot. I, You know who you are. <laughs> like, you know who hey, you are. Nota, like, you want to hear crazy. something crazy? Back oh, when I was oh. actually a professional at Counter-Strike, you won't believe this, I played not only with mouse acceleration, but an uh. inverted mouse. What? Up was down, and mouse? down was up. Yes. That's Jesus how I learned Christ, how to play man. FPS game. And the funny thing is, once I changed it because I got peer pressured, I was never as good as when it was inverted. Something about my brain. I don't know what the fuck it is. Yeah, you but, have everything upside down, basically. <laughs> I guess. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Your brain uh, is in your ass. And it's yeah, like, well, I, I've heard that one before, no. actually. So <laughs> let's, get into, let's get into Han a little bit. I'm sorry, Sindarin. How many games did you ever play with Han, Sindarin? Before we uh, zero, <laughs> okay, but just making sure. I do have uh, before you go all this. I have a little <laughs> bit of a story because I watched a very little bit of Han. And guess oh. what? I actually watched Fnatic win at Dreamhack, and I think Nota uh. was playing in that roster. I think it definitely. was definitely it was definitely going off memory. Me. Going off memory, I think it was you, Trixie. Uh, mm -hmm. What was he called? This guy, the guy that always wore the sunglasses and bandana. Nova. Nova. Yeah. Nova. Um, was it fresh did you play pro with era um, at the time or not yet i mean may mm, it was honey era, for sure, era, i think it was honey too. oh then it was era yeah yeah yeah. then it was era i think and you played with those four at the same time because then i think that was the roster i watched you beat a team in the finals they were australian i think yeah Recall. yeah yeah. that's the one uh, yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah. The, that's the one yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. guys were the kings I, of han no doubt yeah man it was uh it was crazy it was really weird times playing han like uh I gotta say, teams were really not that good. Uh, <laughs> well, looking back really now, they weren't that, that good. good. But at the time, I mean, they were not know? that good either. But man, they were not that good, and they were really <laughs> stubborn. It was crazy. Like when we first started, like, getting into competitive, I think it only took us like one to two months. And then Tal opened up some Dota replays from the Chinese scene and when some LAN mm -hmm. tournaments and stuff. And they this concept of try lane, try laning, <laughs> like three guys in the same lane. We were like. All right, let's try it. We tried it. People came with their dual lane. Kills really gave a lot. We were just slaughtering them over and over and over. Next game, the, the, the dual lanes again. And this went on for three months, you know? We did try lanes for three months, and they did dual lanes. And we just destroyed them. Everybody, we destroyed them in 10 minutes. The game was done. <laughs> and nobody picked it up. Not a single team try lane yeah. themselves. And yeah, like I got to say, like they, they, were, they were really not that good. Like, like I'm sorry. It's just... Yeah, and so for people that don't know, No Tail was on Fnatic. Of course, this was early on the Dota 2 scene as well, but for the entirety of Han, I think it was just Fnatic. And yeah. they were pretty much like the, if you want to go back to Dota 2, like the early Na'Vi, it was essentially Fnatic for Han, I feel like. Like when you left, that's when Swindle finally started to win some tournaments. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you, by any chance, No Tail, remember meeting me for the first time? Because I vividly remember meeting you. Oh, boy. Was this at the uh, the, um, the the tournament in California? Yes, NASL. NASL, right? yeah, yeah, I think I remember so, you. Yeah, did we meet this in the the stadium or like the basketball thing? It was like a basketball hall. No, wait, you were at that tournament, the basketball hall one. The no, famous? no, 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 not because I know that there's another one. I thought I, my my memory tells me that NASL because the the state whatever the viewing place was completely empty. Well, I no. thought it was also a basketball hall. No, no, there was a bunch of people. That, like uh, Day Nine was there first. It was mostly StarCraft, so Han was like the secondary thing. But you were there with uh, Era was on your yeah. team at that time. So it was the later no, stages. No, Era was on Lions. Era was oh, on Lions. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. It was yeah. on Lions, and they beat us. This was like the only <laughs> lantern we ever lost. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you introduced yourself to me, which this was like early on in my casting career, so nobody really knows who the hell I am. And he's like, I'm a real big fan of you. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, you were literally the first person. It, you were a player as well, but you were the first person, period, that ever came up to me ever in my esports career. So you 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 popped my cherry real good, buddy. So ever since uh, then, I've been a massive. Obviously, I was a big fan before that, but um, uh, yeah, good times, buddy. That was that was move. a time where I was literally <laughs> afraid. This shows you how like I'm an introvert by nature, um, and I just fake it all the time, but. <laughs> Back then, I was literally afraid to say hello to Day Nine. I was, that was like oh, a shit. celebrity shock type of thing, right? I was too scared. Oh, yeah? So I Damn. introduced myself to him. 
uh, because people always call me like the Jewish day nine. So just, just so you guys know, I'm not actually Jewish, but people think I look Jewish. Okay. And actually fly still thinks I'm Jewish. I just didn't want to correct him when he talked about it <laughs> really? uh, way back. <laughs> That's, <when>. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. But so I introduced you have myself to tell as me the story. <laughs> I introduced myself to him as, Hey, I'm basically the guy in Han and they, they call me Jew nine. Just as a joke. <laughs> and the look on his face, I have a picture of it that I should probably post at some point. It, he had no fucking reaction, dude. Zero reaction. <laughs> and I have never talked to him since. <laughs> Literally oh, not since. Shit. <laughs> but no. should, next time you see him, you should be like, yo, it's Jew 9, remember me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so before we move on to Dota 2 stuff, I want to ask you, uh, are there any heroes that you miss? Yeah, there's definitely two heroes I thought were really cool. I really like the Master of Arms concept. I think wow, it's nice. Okay. It's always nice with complicated yeah. heroes. Uh, he mm -hmm. was definitely, of course, a little bit Imba, and you have to change a bit. But the, as a concept, I thought it was really cool. Mm -hmm. Short machine gun, long sniper, uh, global aspect too, uh, scaling aspect, like funny stuff with Maelstrom. Or, yeah, I think it would be one of the most played Dota heroes if if they had him in Dota, I'm pretty sure. I think that would that was some oh, good, satisfying yes. shit, mm. man. It's yeah. like it's like that feeling of getting a four man laser with Tinker or a requiem, like a good requiem with SF. Like getting that fucking that would punch. It's like, <laughs> dude, oh. it was fucking orgasmic. I won't lie. Oh, yeah, it was so yeah. good. What about? Uh, uh, well, I, I don't remember you playing that. You probably did because you were mid for a while. Uh, Chipper is my personal favorite. That I think wow. if they put that Disgusting. hero in Dota, it will be a top five played. Right? That is like such a fucking fun hero, and it's it's an a int, fun hero. Right? Yeah, but so it's also, cool it was so imbalanced. It was so freaking imbalanced. everything was some imbalanced. Some stages, though, you know. <laughs> yeah, then it was a whole I, Gemini bug. Oh, the last forever. What about uh, like mechanics? Yeah. Do you miss anything from Han that you? Um, Wish was in Dota, like turn rates, things like that? I, I don't think it's as... So in Dota 1, I definitely... It was a much welcomed uh, change that everything was smoother and a little bit quicker. And I think mm. Dota 2 has it at a good pace. I think Dota 2 is still much quicker than Dota 1 when it comes to these things. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's good enough. I wouldn't make it faster, really. I think it's part of the charm. Uh, it's the turn rate of Dota and the fact that some heroes have much less and some just have that average that's more. In Han, it was also quick. Um, I guess I, w I, I could say that a couple of item inspirations could happen. I think Dota has a lot of good things going for it. I, I think we have so much. We, we, we can't say that they're doing a bad job when it comes to this, but some inspiration when it comes to items, like the Harkens Blade, oh. not necessarily saying that was balanced, like how it was in Han for the heroes that were there. But, you know, some more items for the Int heroes or some more item for the Aggie heroes, like early on, now that Aquila is gone and stuff. Even though Aggie heroes are really, really fucking strong right now. But, yeah, you know, like to um, get some good inspiration because I, I think Han was not afraid to make things a little complicated. And I really like that. I mean, we saw it with Chipper. We saw that Deadwood wasn't super complicated, but it has some complexity. Mm -hmm. Master of Arms, much more complicated than your average hero. Um, this part I really like. And I think the game sh should have more of this than, you know, the simple stuff. So, this Cinder is actually, this is a really mm -hmm. good talking point. If I can just bounce off that, because. Yep. Um, Something that's been happening in Dota lately, in my opinion, when you look at hero design, is that heroes that had low win rate but were very good in competitive, like Chen, like Io, yeah. uh, were more or less redesigned to be more accessible and easier for the average player to play. Like Chen's micro got less intensive. Io was didn't have the same maneuverability with the spirits and whatnot. Right. Do you feel like it's a shame, and do you feel like it's a necessity to like lower complexity for the average player at the cost of what it does in competitive Dota? Like, what do you think? Is this a good trade-off, or should we not care? I don't think it's a good trade-off. I think it's a very good point. I think the true shame lies in not teaching people, not giving them the access, accessibility to learn, instead of you know make then instead of making it easier. I mean, we don't. People are getting dumb around the world. We don't have to. We don't have to help that part either. You know, like, just keep the complexity and the the depth of the game, and instead make tutorials or guides whatever it is that can get people to that level like uh, so that they can understand it because i see it all the time in pubs and we all see it people that get to understand dota on a much deeper level and they actually do some next level shit everybody has that ability to to 
to at least play the heroes, you know. Even even a 2K MMR, you can learn to cast spells with Invoker. It just becomes a matter of uh, arithmetic with your fingers. Um, right. I don't know. I definitely... This is why I play Dota, is for the complexity. And they would lose me as a customer, as a player, if it became too simple, um, for sure. So I would have to find another game to play then. I think Dota is, is that game, and it should stay that game, uh, mm. definitely. It's make more of an effort... The... It's interesting with the new heroes because, so I, I, I don't remember who was talking to this, uh, with this at TI, but uh, the last couple of heroes that we got, with the exception of Mars, were re- honestly pretty complex, right? The last yeah. ones that we've had, they've had a lot sure. of depth, a lot of options. Mm-hmm. And then Mars was oh, pretty yeah. straightforward. He's a pretty simple hero, uh, but yeah. I, I don't personally think that uh, inherently simple heroes are bad as long as the design itself is just fun and great to play, right? Do you feel yeah. like... So, for example, these next two heroes that are coming out, what are you hoping for? Do you hope it's, like, super complex, like, let's say, Earth Spirit or uh, simple like Mars? What's what's the goal for you? Kind of, for, What's the ideal new hero? I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind them using some concept from um, another complex hero. I think this is a general misconception that, you know, these things have to stay unique and only be used once. Uh, it can be the troll toggle effect, you know, same as Master of Arms. It's like the range toggle, like uh, toggling uh, some kind of range on some hero or having another hero that combines spells like Invoker does, but instead of three balls, he has two things that aren't balls and you can you can combine them. Uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever it is, like combining arrow, I don't, I don't freaking know, mm-hmm. but having something complex, definitely I would cast a vote for it. Um, and like you said, also inherently, Heroes are more, more simple, aren't bad. I would just like them to have some level of fun. And I think, mm-hmm. I think for example, Wraith King has a he's a super simple hero, but because of the Skelly Boys, he became a fun hero to play. It's like the Skelly Boys army. I had great fun with, with right. playing with skeletons with Wraith King. I think that concept is just really important to have if you keep it simple. I think Mars somewhat has it with the W and the auras and how he can use it and, and stuff. And the ulti has some next level values, but between the spear and the passive... Ugh, you know, or I mean, the spear is also, I guess, all right. But I would have liked shot. something more, yeah. some, yeah, something a little more shiny, maybe mm. that makes them shine a little right. more. So, like, can you guess? Yeah. which of the heroes I love the most right now because it's literally a Han hero, essentially. I'll give you a clue. It's one of the last like six heroes to come out. It's just a Han hero. Come on, though, Till. You know this. Wait, you have to you like just... this hero too. Is it Willow? Dark Willow? No, Pango. Pango. Oh, Pango. If that was oh. in Han, like you, like all right, that fits. Does that not? Like right. It, yeah, yeah. Other yeah, than yeah, maybe yeah. the turn yeah. rate in the ult, that is a Han hero to a T. Yeah. I love the no turn rate. Yeah. Oh, heroes just right. Had vector good. targeting too, right? That was a bigger thing in yeah. Han. Vector wasn't targeting. It? Yeah. I think Han came out with it very early on. There was like some vector targeting stuff uh, as soon as I started playing, or like it was the Forsaken Archer character that had it. Mm-hmm. Like she had that uh, ulti that was vector target. Um, Chipper and yeah, no, Bombardier. Pango, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, Chipper also had and Bombardier had yeah, yeah. So, Bombardier was a really fun hero, man. So Bombardier the funny thing really about fun. Bombardier is he's the same concept as Chipper. It's just slightly different spells. Like it's exactly the same concept, like burst damage and you play the, pretty yeah. similarly. Both Very of them were also so. stupid ass. Yeah. Shit, so man, finishing <laughs> finishing up with Han, I want to say a couple things that I miss because I get to finally talk to somebody that played fucking Han. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. So obviously the, we talked about the turn race, the cast animations, things of that nature. I even though I yeah. didn't do it myself, like when I was watching like pro games, the taunting system I thought was far superior. Like you're a big emoter in the Her. current Dota, if you want to call it an emote or whatever the the chat wheel. Do yeah. you think if they brought taunting from Han, would you enjoy that? So let's no, explain what it no. is. Explain explain from your perspective what taunting and Han is for people that don't know. I mean, taunting was just way over the top. <laughs> it, it was it was crazy, man. You had you put this thing right. You had this cooldown of I don't know sixty seconds or something. You put it on some guy's head, and if you get the kill, I think if you get you have to get the last hit. I'm not sure if your teammate would have killed him. If you would still get. It. I don't think so. I think you have to get the I kill. See you. Yeah. Then it. I don't even remember if it also refreshes the cooldown or something, but it spams this really loud thing that you select before the game. Yeah. And you could choose like a flamboyant pack and it's like, you could choose all kinds of different voice packs. It just packs. pops up on the screen for them like in bold letters and really loud. Yeah, yeah, really freaking loud. But if you don't loud. kill them, then they yes. taunt you. You get taunted back. It's great. You get taunted back. Yeah, ah. And if you die, it also does something else. It gives you the yeah. humiliation or something. <laughs> like, uh, 
Yeah. yeah. All, all I'm hearing in my head with this is the voice wheel from this year's TI with your laugh from when you were casting at the summit. Uh-huh. And I just imagine if you get killed by somebody, that laugh track is just playing for your entire respawn time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, the last thing that I miss from Han, because you can argue the other stuff that we listed, turn rates and all that stuff, you can argue, even though I would disagree, you could argue that it doesn't fit in Dota. This one, there's no reason I can think of that you wouldn't do it, and it's the um, the impact that some of the spells had. Like you mentioned Deadwood's Punch. It just felt yeah. fucking amazing. Pyro, pyro ult. Pyro ult, lion ult oh. with the gun. Uh, even yeah. Sven. Oh. So Sven would oh. ult, right? And then every time you hit something, it's like, brr, brr. Yeah. it was just, oh my God, just gets the serotonin I mean, level. Dota has a lot of that though, doesn't it? No. Uh, Dota has that? some of it. I also, I get it from the Sven in Dota. I get some, I get a satisfaction from the Sven hitting as well. But a hundred percent, like the Lina and Lion ulti are far, far superior in Han <laughs> than they are in Dota. There's some deep level of satisfaction <laughs> that you get, like... You, really, it's worth it just That's to. Good. Oh man, I, yeah, I haven't thought of it for a long time, but you know, this this pyro ulti is like he rams it up your ass. Like, <laughs> where Selena ulti is like good. some weak ass Laguna blade, like some small pellet yeah. that yeah, it hurts, you know. But this one, it's like you fucking you it, get it. The funny thing, it's hard to explain, and it's even even if you look at a video, it's hard to see. You have to play to understand yeah, the feeling. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's nice. to be that, you know, yeah. But does Han have the same feeling of getting last hits on range creeps with Anti Mage? Does it have that? I don't that remember is that being a thing. One of the yeah. most satisfying. Stuff. That's it's more so of a sound. When you talk though, to people about right? when you talk to people about what sounds are satisfying in Dota, I feel like unanimously people love the sound of getting last hits with Anti Mage. Uh, I, mean, I don't know what it is though. Yeah. No. Uh, it does, it's Mage Pain and Han doesn't sound, have the I same. But yeah, it's the, I think it's the Mana Burn sound. Yeah, yeah. it's so satisfying. Plus right. the damage, you're like, yeah. Okay, yeah. so transitioning forward, you go to Dota two. What made what made that decision for you? Was it? I can't even remember. Did you just switch right away, or did you no, take it slow? No. We, it uh, we we were playing Han. Trixie swapped a uh, game before us. He I think didn't feel as motivated. He we all saw the game was not doing uh, better and better. It was doing worse and worse, like mm-hmm. years on Earth. That is, and Dota had had the first international happen, and Trixie swapped. Um, Sometime after that, some um, we had like an open talk, if I remember correctly, and it was it was completely fine. You know, we decided to play play Han because we still really liked the game, and we weren't we were doing really well. So it was also kind of hard thing to give up on. You know, like a game you're passionate about. You, I was losing a bit of passion for it. Like the game was also decreasing in quality. We're talking about the taunts, but there's also so much else. Like they're spamming heroes, they're spamming skins. I mean, one, let's kind be real. Of, once once Ice Frog left, the game started to go in decline in terms of hero design okay, and not, everything, right? Yeah, I'm not really sure how long Ice Frog stayed around for, but there was definitely a lot of cool things happening at first. Uh, I really yeah. like how the game was going at first. But yeah, uh, we went to Dota 2 sometime after TI2, not too long after TI2, and we had a talk about it. The game was doing worse. Dota looked really fun. And I, of course, on a personal level, had a very... Uh, big passion for Dota 1 still. I mean, it was a game that I truly loved. I had so many fond memories of it and with it. Um, and yeah, like we swapped together because we just, we felt good about each other. We felt good about the team that we had in Han. And we we knew that the games were very similar. I mean, they were really similar um, in terms of many things, but it also had its differences. Uh, but yeah, it was like a, we jumped both together. We jumped from one game to the other, decided to uh, become the best team in that game as well first and, step was to get to the international but yeah right and Cinderin and i talked about this and we disagree actually on what the reception was like but from your perspective what was what did you feel like the reception was from a public standpoint in terms of han players coming over to dota was there any was it negative was it neutral was it positive i think there was a lot of uh there was a lot of there's a mix um but i think it was more positive than negative but there was a little really? bit of like uh yeah, okay. there, but there was a little bit of this weird nation, nationalistic get on, feeling. Get, on, get him, no so we, I think Notel's not remembering this... correctly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we had this thread going on on Join Dota. It was like, this was the thing. We had like jokes with Navi about it for fun because Navi had a really big thread going on on Join Dota. It was like the public forum that everybody was going to. We had this uh, Fnatic MSI X Han team something something uh, <laughs> thread that opened up, and it was also getting very big, just getting spammed by posts. And we had this uh, 
ongoing competition between us, Navi and us, about who's going to get to 10k first or some number. I don't remember. <laughs> I think we won. We might have lost, but but yeah, the, the reception was generally good. Um, I would say I think there was a little bit of negativity, a little bit of like, but that kind of negativity is like somebody coming. With what you guys have in the U.S. with somebody who looks Hispanic, they're like, <laughs> "Who's this?" And uh, you, you want to throw them out of there, but they're just we're just uh, hunt players, and yeah, nah, it wasn't it wasn't anything. I bad. just remember hunt trash being a very negative thing to say early on, and then over time it became almost endearing. Like right now, if I say hunt trash, it's, it's a it's a fucking compliment. It's, right? yeah, it's, a, it's a compliment, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like uh, slightly negative, <laughs> ironic to pure irony to now. I mean, after Lions won TI three, Huntresh was ruling, man. Huntresh all the way. <laughs> yeah. So how how long did it take for you to feel like you were in like tier one status? Like you were like, all right, I'm I'm pretty fucking good at this. Like, was it an immediate thing? Did oh, it take a few months? Like compared to the top status. Com competition. I honestly don't think I ever felt tier one until uh, we won Frankfurt Major. Yeah, really, really? Like far from it. Wow. Oh, yeah. Damn. Like, uh, okay. We were uh, very Humble bad boy. on a Dota. No, on a Dota level, we were never tier one. Well, I, 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 sorry, I, I take it more from a personal standpoint as a player versus, forget about the team for a second. Like from personal, like you're playing, oh, I'm actually better than a lot of these people that I'm playing against. Um, I mean, it depends on like what kind of player you are. Like you're, Back in Han, you were very cocky. Like it wasn't like in a moon meander bad way, I would say, but it gave off uh, the air of confidence, right? I don't know if it's the if it's more. Sure, of sure. A, it's just depends I, on I everyone's pretty, perspective. I was pretty cocky. Yeah, I was pretty cocky, I guess, in Han. Um, <clears throat> I was also very young. It was young mentality, um, but I felt like I felt like we were really good, and I also felt like my ideas were pretty good when it came to Dota in general um, and the MOBA MOBA genre. Well, I guess it's Dota because that's the tools I was working with. But there's a lot of things that people were doing back then that I disagreed with and a lot of things that weren't being done. But I never had proof that I was right. So I might have had the idea that I was good in Tier 1. Sure, I get it from my public games where I was winning a lot of the public games. I was mm -hmm. also losing some, but I was winning a lot. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we made it to TI3. So yeah, deep down, I felt like I was good enough. But okay. For the most part, no man. Uh, huge doubter, doubted myself a lot. We never, we never did shit until Frankfurt, mm -hmm. like when, it, like good enough shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when when you switched over, because uh, I I kind of remember this phase because uh, I was also playing at the time, right? Um, mm -hmm. That when you guys switched over, it was obviously a slow start because you're really far behind everybody. It's it's clear yeah. like you're switching games. You yeah, need to yeah, relearn. Yeah. Uh, what do you think was the hardest part of getting good in Dota was was it overcoming learning the game, or was it that you said the teams in Han were bad? Were the teams in Dota two just on average way better than the best teams in Han? Like, what was the biggest challenge to overcome? Uh, I mean, it's a it's a hard question to answer because I think there's a lot of things that um, a lot of things that that play that play a part. Uh, a big thing was obviously how we were doing as a team, like the habits that we were having, how we're approaching the game, how we're approaching atmosphere. All these things had a huge impact. I think if these things would have been better, we would have become a really good team and we would have also become a, a team that would use our potential much more. But the the time that uh, things really started changing, I mean, like I said, Frankfurt Major, and the reason why, I think it was all the experience. I think Dota teams had a lot more experience. All the Dota teams, a lot of these really smart Dota players, um, including you guys. I mean, you guys were spanking us. Um, all this experience, like how you're losing games, you're losing to anti mesh split push, you're losing to this guy winning, crushing his mid matchup, you're losing because, uh, you know, Navi are abusing Chen or Ench and you don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So it was like a lot of getting punished. You kept getting punished, punished, punished. Eventually, you learn, like, each strategy and each way of losing and you... You try and apply a different way of uh, dealing with it, and eventually you mm -hmm. get better and better and better. So it was a lot of experience, and I think it it took a turn when we started applying a lot of this experience into um, into our new team. I mean, a big thing that happened with the first iteration of OG was, was that we were trying to do things our way instead of doing it in um, other people's way with a lot of mixed uh, uh, mixed approaches. So. Mm -hmm. 
there was a lack of leadership. There was a lack of direction, like a good direction. And with that roster, we finally set a lot of things straight and we were allowed to play really good Dota. We were allowed to apply strategy. We were allowed to properly counter what the enemy is doing because we were all feeling really well and the atmosphere is really good and we we're allowed to play our best. So yeah, a lot of things came into play for why we started doing well and why we we're getting so spanked at first. But a big thing is just, it's the same thing, why there's never going to be some random, I mean, Wings was, I think, the closest example that we're ever going to get, and we're never going to get something like it. You're never going to have five guys somewhere in Southeast Asia or China or America or anywhere with no experience or very little who's just going to come in and win a big tournament. It's never going to happen because Dota requires you to learn <laughs> learn the hard way. You need to get that experience. Mm -hmm. You're going to lose to anti -Mage, split push. You're going to try to defeat... Uh, now I'm going to take us an example. You're going to try to defeat OG with Thompson, Quas, Vex, Invoker mid where you pick him a bad matchup, but then you're going to lose because Ana is playing Spectre and you didn't deal with that. You know, there's like many layers to it. And yeah, you have to you have to play a lot and lose a lot. That's You mm -hmm. have to lose a lot. So why do you think Wings could do it? Was the scene that year not so strong or was like a miracle or... I mean, DC got second, so that's pretty shitty, right? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, I think it's a mix of many things. I think the biggest, because I don't think you can take credit away from them. They were really freaking good. And I think the reason why they were that good was, one, they had played Dota for a very long time. So, like I said, they're the closest example, but they did have a lot of experience. They also had some competitive experience between some of them. But two, I think that they were one of the few teams that actually understood what it was to have a really good atmosphere during playtime, like during tournament time. I know they had their ups and downs throughout the season and throughout some tournaments and their boot camps, but I think for a lot of tournaments and especially TI, that perfect team atmosphere. They had team morale. They they, they looked like a team. They felt like a team. So they could play the best Dota. And at TI, you know, like releasing pressure and not playing uh, bad is half the half the battle like not playing way below your average is half the battle because a lot of mm -hmm. teams just lose lose to that so uh, yeah. boot camping for ti6 funny story i think maybe i mentioned this on the podcast before i don't think no tails heard this though uh dc was playing wings probably more than any other team actually which is interesting oh, yeah. because a lot of times you have like these teams that are just practicing against each other that end up in the finals like the eg cdc example is another yeah. one um but the funny thing is you're talking about how they have a good atmosphere and for the most part I agree except this one instance apparently and I heard this from Jack behind the scenes yeah this is one I've heard too oh okay so we crushed them so many times in a row with like Magnus mid which for some reason uh, Weeha never picked at TI I don't know why um, that they just rage quit for the day and we didn't play them again until TI uh, so I guess and they, they got almost their got shit into together. a fist fight uh, yeah. they all, apparently they almost <laughs> got into a freaking fist fight or some shit you know <laughs> But that was uh, TI because of good atmosphere. Go. We can turn it around, man. Anything can be turned around. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I, it can be. I mean, our boot camp before this year's TI was rough as fuck, man. It was crazy rough. Like, we had a big downer. We were still all working hard, but uh, we're going through some shit, everybody individually, and then it goes into the team and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we had this really nice uh, pep talk the day before group stage starts and we're about to scrim Navi or somebody. I don't remember. And we're like, yeah, guys, we're going to fucking do this together. We're going to go. We get destroyed both <laughs> games. <laughs> and it's like, oh, fuck. We have to play tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you guys have the experience from last year, though, to learn, right? So you know what it takes to win. That's, that's definitely a very valuable <laughs> thing to have in the back pocket, if you will. Right, but you can use that argument, but yet nobody wins TI twice, more or less. And it's also it's also because people don't take the last TI win and use it. I think everybody gets the last TI win and it's being used against them. Mm. It's like you, you learn or you prove to yourself that you can do something or you at least prove to yourself that you are good enough to win TI. But every year, I think that TI, like the team that won the last TI goes into the uh, into the tournament with a mentality like, shit, we have to defend this or... What if we lose? We're losing our pride from last year. And, and they're dealing with a lot of pressure from the outside. I mean, <laughs> TI9, all the interviews start with this. Uh, like, uh, so as a as a defending <laughs> champion, and you're like, wait, what the fuck's going on? Like, every yeah. person who came uh, up yeah. to us like, always talked about it. And that's uh, that's pressure. That's So I, yeah, I do want to talk about these TIs in just a minute. But first, I want to finish up with one topic. So... Yeah. You are one of the most flexible players of all time, in my opinion. Uh, correct me where I'm wrong here. Yeah, from Han. Can you do this? Huh? <laughs> what is, what is, 
<laughs> yeah, literally flexible as well. Holy shit. How? Damn it. I can't do that. Jesus. Um, you're like an alien. That's like an alien looking at hand. Um, you yeah. got me trying to do that. Did you do this? <laughs> yeah, oh, you got it. What? You got it, actually. Nice. Yeah. Not many people can do it. I No, I'm... It's yeah. rigid, you know? I don't know what that means yeah, for me. It but It's a Danish thing. We learn it in school. <laughs> good flex, good yes. flex, man. All right, so Weird flex, you, okay. you have played, if I'm not mistaken, every single position professionally other than three? I couldn't think of when you played offlane. Is this true? I played uh, I played some stand-in offlane in Han, or maybe for a little bit I played some offlane in Han. Um, stand-in, or was it official, like, Fnatic games? No, it was like, no, it was like Fnatic, like, it's a stand-in. I think it was like trial would because Trixie had moved, I was trying out off lane, or I don't know how I ended up off lane. I don't actually remember, but yeah, basically never played three like okay. for extended period of time. But I played the rest. That that's very cool. So, in terms of how much you've grown as a player, your leadership. How do you think that that has changed since Han? Like, how have you progressed? And is this like a natural thing you feel like, or is it something you learn on the fly? Is it a mix? Nah. Um learn on the fly i like what you did there um, no pun intended hey. <laughs> hey. hey no definitely i'm not a born leader i would never claim that i'm a born leader i i've grown into taking responsibility uh it, i but i'm naturally i naturally shed off responsibility like i i don't want it um i'm still that kind of a person but i enjoy uh part like on taking the responsibility when needed and when time is there it's a nice challenge but it doesn't naturally happen to me. I, I thrive mostly around people who do have that natural leadership. Uh, it becomes a very nice um, balance. Uh, but throughout the years, I mean, I've gone through my own. I think every human being on, on earth does it, right? But it's okay. own personal journey. And I've gone through mine, uh, still going through mine. And I've learned a lot. Um, learned a lot about myself. Learned a lot about uh, how people perceive me and um, what my role can be. What kind of a role I can fulfill. Uh, I think I've become a pretty good teammate. I like I like myself when I look at when I try to look at myself from an objective point of view when mm -hmm. how I function in a team and stuff. Um, yeah, it's a lot of lessons. It's a lot of uh, lessons, and it's also being willing to learn. I've seen the people who um, who haven't been as willing to learn, and they usually <clears throat> yeah they usually end up very confused. That's what I see. They end up very confused. Um, so. Yeah, I don't really know if that answers <laughs> your question. No, I, um, it's just it's fascinating to hear everyone's perspective I, on stuff like that. Can I follow up on that for a sec? Because I'm a bit curious about this. So you say you don't feel like a natural leader. Um, do you think in your team now, when you think back on Seb coaching and when I've the little bit of stuff we've seen with you guys on camera and when you talk about Seb as this motivator for your team and whatnot, do you feel like he's taking on more of that born leadership role both in and out of game and you're kind of... You know, like when we see you, your shots from from the booth or whatever, you're sitting with the papers, you're drafting. But right. are you? Is he more of the leadership figure in the team than you are, or do you feel like you've fed off him and become more of a leader yourself? Uh so Seb is a hundred percent natural born leader. Like uh, okay. you, you get that vibe from him, hundred percent. Like you, you're mm -hmm. ready to go into death with him, and and that's that's really a very good thing to have. Um, I don't think you, I don't think most people can grow into it. I think everybody can partake this responsibility for um, any amount of time that they wish to try for. But for some, it just falls very naturally. Um, and Seb is definitely the case. I mean, Sebastian is the leader of our group. Um, but I, I would like to think of myself a bit of the direction when it, we don't have a, a, a crazy hierarchy when it, when right. it comes to the in-game part in-game part is a very nice fluctuant dynamic um without revealing too much i mean people are allowed to do their thing and uh there's direction in the game and a lot of that direction comes from i would say yes to sebastian and me i think a lot of direction comes from us like because there's a lot of experience that talks and topias and anna they have less experience but they they fucking know what they want to do better than we will ever know what they want to do um but we not we, de we know what they can do or what we can do as a team at certain stages of the game that they might not see. I mean, for the most part, I think it's the case, but that's, you know, 30 years of experience that they, they, they can't compete with, and that's just how it is. Right. So direction is what we're more feeding um, when it comes to the Dota part. But outside the game, it's a nice thing, like a nice dynamic. Sebastian's definitely a natural-born leader. 
this year's true side i'm really afraid of how i'm gonna look because i was um i was full animalistic man i went full neanderthal i'm gonna look like a freaking caveman i'm dry humping people <laughs> and that's kind of that's kind of what i i think i'm offering to the team is a bit of oh, good spirit good morale kind of like a gesture maybe uh, comic but, relief man that's part of it. it's very yeah, important. comic relief yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really worried, man. Uh, it's going to be a good, 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 good watch, though. I, I hope so. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so before we move on to OG and the two TIs, which I want you to kind of tell the story of those. Uh, so going back to how many positions you've played, taking out the leadership aspect or any communication type stuff, just pure playing-wise, what is your favorite position to play? It can't be five. Um, it can't be. Uh, it's five and one. I like both. I really, really enjoy both. Um, yeah, I, it's what I've spent the most of my life thinking about. Uh, even though I did play a lot of position two in, in Han, you could see how it naturally trends. So for me, I care more about winning. I care more about winning the game as a team. I don't give a shit about my score. I don't give a shit about my game unless I care, like I should care about it to mm -hmm. win the game. And in Han, I naturally started progressing more to the Witch Slayers and the Polyworks mid, which is, you know, Lion and Rasta. And it was a, a big camping meta. And I went from, you know, the greediest ass motherfucking Shadow Fiend mid, getting all the farm, all the resources into that more supportive uh, playmaking, protecting, uh, stabilizing, controlling mid. And that's because I really want to win the game. And I think I do the best from 5-1. and one. Mm. But the one position has to be the right position too. Otherwise, I'm not going to enjoy it as much. Um, I'm not. I, I shouldn't be playing it then. It has to be a good relationship between me and whoever plays the position too. Then I can do it. It's like I couldn't play position one with. Um, Sum no, I, I could play with Sumail. I could per perfectly play it with Sumail, or I could play it with Thompson, or I could play it with. Um, uh, I mean, there's a few others. I couldn't, for example, play it with Super. I think uh, I wouldn't enjoy it so much super or the the moves like the, the, the types who are going to play the same way i would play position two exclusively mm -hmm. because my position one i really want to be able to play both similar to miracle miracle is like plays both kind of styles he's able to um, take all the resources become the strategy become the main denominator for the game or he can be become the guy that enables that uh, i like that i like bouncing in between the two but I also just really enjoy playing position five. Playing position five, it's so much fun, man. It's especially in the latest patches, it's been so much fun. I'm jealous. Two tones. What? Yeah, that's jealous true. of what? <clears throat> well, because I I've never enjoyed position five. I'm Shane, very stubborn. Imagine this. Uh, imagine this in your games. Okay. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. imagine dying and feeling good feeling like <laughs> this was a good play like you set up yeah. your team for success and you died because hey, here's your the thing when you die you're like i fucked up it's yeah. it feels really good to set your teammates up for success and feel like you did a good i am a play. very that's selfish very player important. so it could never feel good for me to die you see i care yeah, only about my score okay <laughs> i think yeah, honestly, that's, that's, i think you have five is rough for you then man five's gonna be really rough man you have to embrace <laughs> to death I think that's an inherently really good point, probably about why position five is the least appealing one to pub players. Because, I mean, obviously it's the least flashy, right? But it's also when you're playing a game, you want to you want to have that feeling of I'm doing something crazy or I'm I'm owning, you know, and fives don't get that feeling as much in the game. But yeah. that's what that's what Notel is saying. I think that's a really good point. Like the direction <laughs> fives have taken in the last year or two, we have been buffed a lot in terms of overall game impact. So you yeah. get more of those moments where you feel like, man, I made a huge difference here, or uh, yeah. holy shit, I can outplay the enemy carry as a five, 30 or, minutes or in. Or in fact, know? you just get to join the game. Like that's that's a right. big part. It's like getting that tome and getting that six. Like uh, in a it's, normal Dota game, you might be completely fucked and gimped because your position four Earth Spirit takes the tome. You're stuck level four for the next five minutes. There's going to be two or three team fights happening that you can't do shit in. Uh, whereas now, like you can, you can suck dick and lose your lane by mistake. You can go mid, fuck up the gank, and you're level three at minute, a minute nine. You get the mid wave for three waves. You eat the tome, boom, you're ready. Eleven minutes in, you raise the team fight. You're fucking, let's go, and you fucked up the whole game, but you're still able. You're still able to join it. Like you're not. It's not as punishing as it used to be. There used to be these games where like you lose the lane, you're playing et, somebody needs the one tome. And you're just like, fuck, dude. The first team fight that you can join and actually have an impact is going to be 20 minutes in. Because, yeah, wow. it's like a constant, you know, recovery mode. 
you just reminded me of vintage Dota 1 Chinese Earthshaker with level 2 yeah. minute 10. Yes, I just yeah, remember, literally yeah, yeah. Fissure bot walking around yeah. the map. Yeah, that didn't, yeah. never happens. Anymore. You really got to care about winning to still enjoy playing the game when you're playing shit like that. Like, you really got to... <laughs> I remember a game yeah, from yeah. back in the day where they would buy... Uh, Earthshaker would buy recipes of something just because it's all he could afford and then because he would oh, die would so often it. and then sell it yeah, yeah. just to get the Blink Dagger eventually. That is oh, horrifying. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, moving on. OG... You create it, just going chronologically here. Uh, we had a meeting, actually, before you made it, um, yeah. which I've actually told this story. And I was convinced... You were my favorite player of all time. You still are. And I really wanted to make an org with you. But logistically, it just made more sense to do NA. And you guys chose correctly, let me tell you that. You guys dodged a bullet there. So, well done. Shit. Buddy. <laughs> you oh, won. Shit. You win two majors with uh, the Miracle roster, right? And yeah. then you have a little bit of... You don't do well at TI, and then you shuffle a bit, and then you end up winning yeah. two majors again with uh, the Moon Meander roster. No, uh, the Moon Meander, Moon Meander was, was in the original roster. one. Right? Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. So Who the was next on one the... was a Jarex and not... Yeah, yeah, that's right. Jarex so, 4. <clears throat> what's the biggest difference between those two squads in your estimation that versus each other? Like, is there any um, big discrepancy? Uh, it's vastly different approaches, vastly different dynamics uh, in the game. So I would say Crit and Moon for Jarex and S4, it was similar stuff. I mean, it was people who were uh, <laughs> good with words, good to explain how they look at the game, and good to, I mean, very easy to work with when it just came to the Dota part, as in, yeah, we could always talk and understand each other. Uh, so not much change in terms of Dota there. Like new heroes, new ideas. Uh, saying that not much change, that's a big lie. A, a lot did change, but in terms of communication, not a lot changed. Mm. As for Miracle and Ana, vastly different. Both in play and in communication and how, how you have to approach the two. Vastly different for me. I mean, playing with Miracle, uh, it's a great treat. It's a huge blessing. But he is um, a very emotional player when it comes to... When it comes to this game, which is very nice. I mean, for, for me, as uh, somebody who was getting older and older, I mean, we're all getting older and older. There's no getting younger and younger. But uh, you can also get lose a bit of um, y that young motivation, young passion for the game. Miracle yeah. very much had that. And he was very inspiring to play with. When he, well, what's hard is like, for me as a player, I, I want to do good in my games. And one day I would have to play Death Prophet mid. The next day I would have to play Jugger safe lane. And he is, he is good, and he's young, and he's playing a lot of pubs, and he was able to do that like very quickly. I wasn't always able to keep up. I was, I mean, I was keeping up, but not always. The times that we did the best was when we had a very stable and healthy dynamic where I wouldn't get thrown into something completely new because his emotions were telling him he wanted to play something one certain day, and then I had to compensate or overcompensate by playing something that I hadn't played in a very long time. But... Like I said, it was a, that's a trade-off that I was very happy to make and that we were all very happy to make together, uh, play with a, an emotional player. It's, it's not a bad thing. It's just um, it's a different thing. But yeah, then Anna, much different, much younger. For the first major, I think he... Uh, oh boy, like he was so much... Uh, not worse, but uh, behind as a player than he was at Kiev. He didn't know what creep aggroing was at Boston Major. Mm. Like... Be, or just before Boston Major, he didn't know that you could aggro creeps by right clicking the enemy. Like he didn't know. So that that to me was absolutely <laughs> crazy. Like he would be fucking crushing his mid lane, then because the other guy would pull the wave to his hill, he would start losing it, and he'd be like, "What the fuck? Like, what was going on? I was crushing him on one like in some one v ones at my place. And I don't know, man. I wasn't any I wasn't any good. I wasn't better than him at all. But it was because he was making the game so fucking hard on himself. Mm -hmm. While I was running around with some creep wave, he would just pull his into the tower without giving it a second thought. These small things. Um, people are camping some high ground. He would just assume that they're not there. When like this habitual thing of assuming that the enemy is doing like a, a level of play that's pretty good, he didn't have it uh, for a bit. So he was a work in progress when we first got him, but. So much potential. I mean, a crazy amount of potential. I think Boston, if it would have been a double elimination, it would have been a hard tournament for us to win. But we ended up um, having a smooth run, easy run. But we also abused the shit out of some strategies. Uh, we did it. We executed them really well. We became a this this OG uh, with Anna. Um, 
GRX and S4, we became, I think, one of the teams close to what we also did in Manila, but we abused the heroes that we were given really well because we all knew their timings. We became a very strategic team. Uh, yeah, it was it was very nice to play in this, like abusing the draw, abusing the TB, abusing Alk, abusing Naga. We knew all these strategies to a T. Like, I think it was really hard to play against us and draft against us at, uh, at certain times in, with these rosters. Um, but yeah, I don't really know. I also feel like a lot of Dota teams were going through their own uh, struggles at, at uh, certain points in both seasons um, that we oh, yeah. then took advantage of. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, you... we, we were the best teams. We were we were the best team, sorry, uh, for the most part in, in those two seasons. Not, whole... not, not TI, but yeah. Yeah, well... We'll get to that in a second. The whole Anna not knowing the mechanic, that's very interesting because something similar happened at TIA 6 with Weeha. I can't remember the exact mechanic, but he didn't know something. It might have been like aggroing creeps by clicking on the creeps on the other side of the map. Something I don't know what it was. Basically, he was losing yeah. every single lane, and then one of our coaches told him this little tiny tip, and we just started winning instantly. And that's how we got second right. place, literally from one mechanic. And it's like, it may seem obvious to some of the pros that... You know, you just learn this stuff over time, but it's not like anybody really talks about it. You know, sometimes things like that cannot filter through. And it's just fascinating to know that pros don't know everything. Yeah. You know, it's just. No, they don't. And often there's a big, big scary wall when people, when people see it for the first time. It can be microing, for example. People are like, oh my God, microing. How do you do it? Oh my God, it's so hard. Well, if you do the right keybinds and you play around with it for two days, it becomes like a fun, interactive, small game in itself for you. And give it one, two weeks, you might even become freaking good at it or it becomes super manageable. It's the same thing, like I always use the same analogy. It's the same thing as driving a manual uh, manual stick in a car. For the first couple of days or even the first week, you're monka essing the shit out of the, the, <laughs> like, the gears, right? You're like, fucking hell, I have to change gear and you have to find the clutch and everything. Two weeks, two weeks in, you don't even think about it. You're not even giving it a second thought. You're thinking about something else. You're looking at the road. You're thinking about your shopping list, wherever it is. You get that excess um, space to draw it back into Dota. Like you might be struggling with micro for a week or two, but then all of a sudden you find yourself thinking about the fight, how you're going to centaur stomp this guy while using the penitence on another guy, and it becomes a walk in, walk in the park. Like it's not so hard. It's not so. Um, insurmountable like that scary wall like yeah yeah it becomes much less muscle Just, memory is a beautiful yeah. thing very, oh, yeah. very beautiful yeah okay so moving on again uh so before ti8 fly leaves s4 leaves for eg you get your roster is essentially in shambles from many people's perspective what was that like for you that period yeah so it was very dark days it was it was a it was almost straight out of a, out of a book, like uh, that whole event. Mm -hmm. um, uh, team was in shambles. We were probably deep down all thinking the same thing. Like, are we going to call it quits? Are we going to stop right here? Because that was a very real possibility. I I think we were all at that moment just... It's almost like a heavy thing just got lifted off your shoulders. Not that it was willingly, not that you wanted it, but... You almost had the chance to be like, fuck it. Um, no point, you know, going through that hardship. Like, imagine pulling, like, you, you, what, what we're thinking at some level, probably all of us, I mean, at least for myself, is what if we just make an open qualifier team? It's going to be half as we're going to lose <laughs> open qualifier, and then that's that, you know? I'm going to fucking watch TI from home. Mm -hmm. Might as well go home now anyway, you know? Or another thought is, oh, okay, we make an open qualifier team and we make it, but we're going to go to TI, we're going to fucking get smashed, you know? Like, what's the fucking point of that? Like, do, is that even something I want to do? Like, just make mm -hmm. it to TI and get smashed. <clears throat> but that, and it was like full survival mode. Uh, we're going to fucking do this. I was I was up every morning thinking about the same thing. Like, no way, no way. This is how it's going to go down. No fucking way. Like, this is this isn't right. A lot of hard work, a lot of TIs wasted. I mean, losing TI6 and TI7, the way we lost them and the way we went into them, that that really left, uh, I'm still really scarred over it. So didn't couldn't couldn't just, you know, end it there. Couldn't just skip the beat. Um, I mean, I'm saying this with a smile, but back then, man, it was really dark <laughs> days. Like, it was really I can imagine. Rough. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we went into the 
went into the uh, boot camp. I mean, first we made the team in Paris, which was a funny process. We didn't have much time. Also, really dark days. It was raining almost every day. I was in charge of the hotel booking, which was a huge mistake. Booked for like the next month. Then I booked one <laughs> hotel for one day. I booked the next one for two days. Me and Jerox were moving from hotel to hotel like every morning. Stressful times. I was, I was exhausting. I was even more than we had to be. You know, we were already freaking exhausted. So, funny stuff. You know, uh, we make the roster. We go home for a couple of weeks just to completely uh, like let go. Um, wait, no, I got the timeline wrong. Actually, we didn't get a break here. It was we had to go to the yeah, yeah we had to go straight into the open qualifier. Yes, yeah, yeah. So we go into the open qualifier right after we make the roster. Um, Super majors done. They're also going to their qualifier. We have a small boot camp before it starts, uh, less than a week. And this is when professional ecstasy kind of started for me. Uh, even though we're dealing with our own um, negative emotions about what had happened, like, yeah, you know, friendship of eight years ended, uh, roster that you want some majors, majors with ended, um, these things. Uh, uh, <clears throat> with Anna coming back, it was a nice um, reminder of, uh, you know, a familiar face. And Thompson was also really fucking good add-on. Like, he's the easiest person to work with. Like, he's the kind of guy that you can interrupt him 30 times. He's not even going to get triggered. You know, you can just <laughs> take charge of the conversation. You can <coughs> tell him what to do. You can tell him he's a bitch. He's still going to be friendly to you, you know? Sounds Deep like Weehaw. Huh? That's exactly like yeah. Weehaw. Huh? Yeah. Okay, but it's really nice to have that kind of a person in your group, you know? You can't oh, yeah. have too many of the other kind. You can only have one or two of the... Mm -hmm. loud ones but this guy you can have an infinite amount of so yeah professional ecstasy started right away everybody was both feet in you know heads down really focused we were um working in a very healthy hard-working environment dora 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 everybody was thriving feeling very good we crushed the qualifier and now we get to go home uh and this was a much needed break i had two two weeks of summer in denmark barely played dora was full chill Full relaxation, and then we went to Canada to uh, resume boot camp for TI. Just complete ecstasy again. We had <laughs> we had some funny statistics like we kept getting crushed by liquid. Liquid were rolling over us. We were getting completely smashed. Uh, it hurt like the, it was like the wind getting knocked out of us. Mm -hmm. That kind of a scrim. Like we got destroyed by them. And then we also had another statistic where we, we were like. 113 or 013 with Darkseer, but we kept fucking trying. Like, Darkseer is a good hero, guys. Darkseer is a good hero. Uh, but other than that, the bootcamp was very successful. We won we won more games than we lost, and we felt very confident. We had so many strategies. We felt like we were the best team, um, or that at the very least, we could be the best team, but if we weren't already. Um, and yeah, we built a huge team morale. We, we built a wall around ourselves. Nobody could penetrate. Everybody who was uh, in in the group felt like everybody had his back. So, yeah, we got something really good going from that boot camp. Went into TI. Every game was just pure bliss. Like, uh, we had so much fun. Mm. So much fun. We didn't think of anything. Like, uh, in particular, we just played the game. Had fun with each other and, yeah, cr crushed it. We every, like My way to explain it is when we would lose a game, when our throne would die, I would kind of be taken back. I would like not understand what just happened. Like, did we lose? Because we always thought about winning. We always thought about how we could win. Mm -hmm. So, like, losing was like a like not really an option. And if it happened, it was uh, like a mysterious thing. Like, it shouldn't have happened. So we had a very good mentality. Um, yeah, and those the whole three months, fun, man. the fun atmosphere that you're talking about. It obviously really shows and i think that's why you guys have even more fan like, obviously you guys winning two ti's helps but that alone is <laughs> makes you a fan favorite i feel like uh so after what, what was winning that ti like for you so that was, it was in five game about... series Whew. oh yeah oh yeah no it couldn't <laughs> have been won in any better way so i mean yeah. the emotions right after is of course like it's crazy it's wild it's a uh, pure and pure ecstasy it's the whole Three months of hard work, com like uh, culminating. I don't know if that's a word. It, it all comes together uh, at that one moment, uh, and yeah, like uh, an ex extraordinary high. Like um, it was crazy, and the weeks following was also a um, big, big reward because you 
like you you asked me the question before like do i feel did i when did i feel like a tier one player well now i truly felt like a tier one player now i actually felt like i was um good good at the game like super super good at the game uh potentially the best and uh it's not about like being the best is not really what matters to me being so good that i can envision something and make it happen that's what i really care about the feeling that i can make something happen with my two hands and that i competent my like my competence was being tested year after year at TI, and now I finally got the seal of approval. Like I'm competent, and I took that I, I took that with me very much so th- throughout the next year. I did. You always lose it. You always lose your belief in yourself. It's up to you to find it, and it's uh, also nice when people around you help you find it. But I had it for a very long time after TI8, <clears throat> like the feeling that I was a competent person and mm-hmm. good at Dota. So yeah. <laughs> Very good. It felt very good to win TI8. And then leading into TI9, the season for you guys was, it wasn't was quite the same as the previous year in terms of, I mean, it was a little bit of roster instability. Anna wasn't around for a, long, a lot of it. Uh, yeah. Can you sum up that year briefly leading into TI9? Yeah, sum it up. Uh, very strange beginning. Um, winning TI, everybody, excuse me, everybody start, starts looking at you differently. Um, the bullseye. All the t- yeah, all the teams that you're looking like, uh, all the teams that you're competing with, they, they look at you with different eyes, a mix of um, mix of jealousy and spite. The, there's a lot of spite that goes on, and it, it's very strange. It makes it hard for us to talk to others. Um, yeah, and it's also hard for us to actually work with the new players because you have this stigma of being a TI winner, and it's almost as if you overshadow them, and it's, it's a, it was a very strange position to be in. Um, we were, we also had Igor on for a while, and that was a very pleasant experience. But uh, we had a bit of a language barrier, so mm-hmm. we were yeah, we were struggling with uh, with making the roster work the way we wanted it to. Uh, we did feel like the four of us had the same thing going from TI game understanding and full trust in each other. Uh, but we were making it really it was really hard for it to click with with the fifth and to. Yeah, get the thing going. So when Anna said that he was re- <clears throat> looking to come back and looking to play again, it was a natural move. It was the only move that was going to keep everyone happy. Um, and then it started becoming a much more pleasant experience. Even though we weren't winning, we were yeah not working together. We had fallen into a few bad habits. But overall, still very positive, still very good. Uh, things were getting a little bit grim towards the TI bootcamp, like I mentioned before. But it was it was a fun uh, it was a fun year overall. Overall, it was a, still a very fun year. Get to uh, enjoy the year as a TI winner. That's something that I really felt like I owed myself. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I played I played Dota very freely because I had won that that TI. <laughs> like uh, I was able to pr- play without that um, judging eye in the back of my head. Like, are you good enough? Uh, now I was trusting myself, you know? So my best you... example, just one 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 example just to make is my best example is when I'm back in base and I'm not full mana, I sometimes buy that fucking clarity now without doubting myself because fuck that, <laughs> 50 gold. I want TI. <laughs> fuck that. Yeah, I get that mana region. Yeah, I get to so do that now. I, I wanted to ask you, this is something I've been thinking about. Because when you see like again, there's only so much you can really read from camera, but when it comes to the celebration of you guys winning the second TI compared to the first. Um, can you try to explain like the difference in emotion of yes i finally did it and now oh my god i'm the first one who ever did it twice like yeah is is there a good way of putting this into words or can you not really describe it like w- was there a bigger win for you for example of the two um so the first one was uh, i've answered this question a few times i'm gonna try to answer it better now because i've thought about it and the first time was a be- uh, a bigger win on my confidence um the second win was a better was a bigger win on keeping my confidence for sure it's uh, <laughs> it's a very uh, reassuring thing that you can do it again of course um mm-hmm. not to let it get to to my head or to <laughs> to dig into this but it's very funny we won the first uh major with OG and it was lucky, it was a fluke. Second one, we were abusing strategies or Miracle was carrying. Third one, uh, illusion abuse. Fourth one, alchemist abuse. First TI, fluke, you know, there's always something. There's always freaking something. Winning yeah. TI twice now, 
that was the most reassuring, <laughs> like that was the reassuring of the reassurance. Like now I should never doubt myself. And the, the people here and in, in, who were there in that booth and the people who were working around us should never doubt themselves. What we're doing, we're doing it right. And mm -hmm. it's important to have that and carry that with us. Um, but yeah, definitely was first one was bigger for the confidence. Second one was bigger for keeping it. Um, it was, there's always a big difference is how you win. So the first one, we won the game five in a very intense series. We had played three, a best of three against LGD. It was also super fucking intense. Uh, and against Liquid, we managed to break them. And I also think that, you know, they had a very long day and a long day before. They had a lower bracket run the whole way. Uh, and we managed to break them, also break them a bit in the drafting game too. So the emotions are a little dampened. You know, at the winning moment because of that, I mean, holy shit. Like, you, you can also watch it at uh, the Kiev game five. Like, when the finals is intense, the celebration also goes yeah. with it. Um, right. Yeah, definitely. So how big of an impact did having a psychologist have on your team? Uh, Mia was great. Yeah. Yeah. Have you said anything you want to add? Well, just I was just going to say, because you, you had some health issues previous to the tournament, right? <laughs> And I don't know exactly what your guys' psyche was in terms of going into the t into this t last TI, but is that when you got the psychologist? When was this, actually? I don't know if I know the exact date. Was it right before TI or something like that? We basically got her before the boot camp for TI. Um, she did some... I mean, we had some introduction over phone, uh, mm -hmm. the ones that didn't meet her. Uh, I met with her in Copenhagen before. Uh, she was she was great to have around. Uh, so having a sports psychologist depends on... Um, it always depends on the match. And when I say that, I think sometimes the psychologist isn't the right fit. I think it's not uh, so often the case. I think more often the case is that the team is not 100% ready and willing and open to the idea of what this person can do for you. Uh, so she's there from a very psych psychological uh, point, uh, standpoint. First of all, um, well, you, uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say it like that. She's a, there from a very sports point of view, first of all, like sports psychology uh, viewpoint of all. First of all, we had a lot of things on lockdown when it came to atmosphere, habits, um, people being enabled. And these are the things I think, first and foremost, she's going to try to help with um, to make that thing happen. Uh, second of all, sh then she's there for us on an individual level, on a mental health kind of level, uh, psychological kind of level. And we were all uh, using her, taking advantage of our situation like that we had her to help. Uh, and I think there was a tremendous help. I think that was the uh, another uh, good few percentages that we brought in for ourselves. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of teams wouldn't benefit because they aren't accepting of the help. They're not right. looking for the help, so it's not going to really help. You know? so weird though, so right? It's like it. in traditional sports, it's just standard. It's just every single team has something like that, right? And I know that we don't want to compare ourselves to traditional sports a lot of the time, but stuff like that, I feel like, it, like how does it even hurt? Like, especially with kids that are this young, like you're still mid-20s. That's still fucking young, you know? Yeah. Having somebody like that that has experience and help each other talk, like we're talking about a bunch of probably introverts that have a hard time talking to each other in general and yeah. one person gets mad then somebody hates another person like there's so much drama that you can just bypass by having somebody on the outside just telling hey this is how you're supposed to do it blah blah but blah yeah, right I, I feel like it's easy for us to say and understand that because we're like experienced with life in general i'm an a old lot of fucking pro man. players yeah i mean some of these pro players right they're they might be introverted but they're still introverts that have a huge ego that think you know True. they're I mean, it, you need to have an ego to an extent to to be the best at, at it, right? You need to believe in yourself. But right. it's, this, it's this dangerous line where you can believe in yourself, but you can also believe in yourself so much more than everybody else, including on your team, that it becomes arrogance, right? And if you reach that point of arrogance, you're like, what's a psychologist going to help me? You know, I'm the best. Like, if we're losing, it's... And that yeah. already is a bad mentality, right? So you can understand yeah. that... If you That's want to a have a psychologist problem. for a team, if you want to have a psychologist for a team, I think all five players have to be in the right mindset. If it's even one person in the team that isn't welcoming the help or doesn't understand it, I feel like it might be a detriment in the end because it's going to split people more than it unites yeah. them in a way, right? Uh, yep, maybe. I totally am agree. I wrong on this, Snowtail, or what do you think? Like, no, it sounds about right. Uh, I mean, it's also what kind of a, what kind of an example are you setting that if you have a group? I mean, it's basically like a group project. 
somebody's pushing the project forward or coming up with ideas and then somebody's being um, negative or arrogant to the point where it's going to shut down you know forward motion forward progression i mean this is a big fucking problem it's a big problem in any project in any group thing um yeah yeah i there's a lot of lack of maturity in um in the scene and i also think it comes a lot this is where it's probably gonna why it's gonna persist for a long time if not forever uh in soccer to move up to move up the ranks or i guess it's like this in most sports you're gonna have to eventually go to go to the pro guys like the people who have made it and whatever or go to the places that they've been working out or training at or you know practicing and this should be a humbling experience pub players where do they go they don't you know, uh, graduate to a high level pub. If anything, they're eventually maybe going to get into a B team, at least in China or something. And this is when you, you can kind of get that resemblance. But mm-hmm. nah, bro, like they're, they're in the pubs, like in the, in that very not so healthy environment very often. And this is where they get pulled out from right away. And then they end up in a pro team and now they're being handed a sports psychologist. They don't get those stepping stones, like That's those true. humbling, humbling experiences. Um, they might come from a place where cockiness just reigns supreme, you know, <laughs> give me mid. Give me mid, motherfucker. If they don't give me mid, they will never get mid. <laughs> I mean, pubbing Dota does contribute to ego, egotism, right? For sure. Um, or if you're climbing up there, I mean, Slack's climbed like uh, a few thousand thousands MMR just from being a nice guy, right? So he uh, also got reward. Have you actually like watched positive, him play? Maybe not though. nice guy. No, I think <laughs> he's been toxic too, but wasn't that... Yeah, I definitely believe that being selfless in pubs, mm-hmm. when you're playing certain roles, is the best way to get MMR. I mean, selfless to an... Uh, to a balance a uh, quick example is like this um miracle um anti-mage game when he got his i remember it was eight or nine k uh, first game uh, first in the, we were in russia we we're all watching it um it's a balance of selfish and selflessness because you in the end what dictates is how much you want to win mm-hmm. if you want to win bad enough you're going to do both uh, and you're going to do it like uh, gradually so he was playing this anti-mage game and he he was being super selfish, like 100%, because he was the only guy who was going to carry this game. He was playing with four way below uh, average players when it came to the level of this game. But he was still being very selfless, as in he was giving his team space because he needed, he still needed his team to win this game, even though they weren't going to do much for him. He was going to give them just enough that he mm-hmm. could afford to give away and still take... Like, he didn't buy Battle Fury this game. He bought this um, uh, Vanguard Manta build to keep making space. Um and I think that's a very good example of what you really want to try to achieve is like a level of selfish and selflessness um, for yourself to yeah climb the ranks uh, because I think it's a mix. Yeah, that's very and you'd say that in a team in a team dynamic too, right? It's like a give and give or take thing where there's some things you get your way, but you also you know you want to enable everybody to the best of their ability. You don't shut a guy down and say this is exactly how you're gonna play. Everybody has yeah. their strengths that they need. But you also yeah. make space, right, for everybody. Else. So there's like two examples, uh, or two two things I could say to that is like, okay, so you have the example of me playing with Miracle. If I told him like, "Yo, bro, I only want you guys to p- enable my TB Naga and Drow strats because they need enabling," and he one day goes like, "Can I play Alchemist?" and I'm like, "Yeah, sure, but only if I play one of these three. and it doesn't fit, right? I'm not. I'm being 100% selfish in this scenario. Whereas if I had the mix or we both had the mix, he could help me one day and I could help him the next. I'm going to play whatever your juggernaut for your alchemist or Nakes or Ursa or whatever is going to win my lane and make some space. And you're going to, you know, vice versa. You're going to rub my, scratch my back when I'm going to need your help. Uh, having having the ability to do both is great in Dota. Dota asks both of you, uh, like both things from you, to be selfish and to be selfless. Because yeah, team game. Team game, yo. Sometimes you're going to have the ball. Sometimes you're hmm. not. All right, last question that I have, and then we're going to have a very short, like, five-minute trivia thing that I think would be fun. I don't want to make this a very long conversation because me and Cinder have talked the shit out of this topic. Do you think that it's good that TI keeps breaking its own record, or do you think that they should cap it and distribute some of that money towards, like, the Tier 2 scene or just other events in general? Hmm. Oh, it's hard to say no when you win twice, isn't it? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I definitely think that there should be ste- uh, steps taken to help the scene, and I think a lot of it has to do with money being made. Uh, what I don't understand is why 
why isn't there more crowdfunding going on for the tier two scene? Like, why don't we make a crowdfunding to see how much people are willing to support the tier, tier two scene, you know? Because TI is a lot about the tier one scene and the ultimate door that you, you can get. And I think, it's, I think it's also weirdly forced if you talk too much about or do too much about the tier two scene at TI, right? I think it's always a nice gesture and I think it should be done. And I think, for example, if, uh, if TI reaches... Uh, record break, uh, breaking amount next year, which I think is, I think it's a positive thing that it keeps breaking records. I think mm-hmm. it's so it's good for esports in general. That it's a statement that esports is getting bigger and bigger. But I think once you make that uh, prize pool happen, you could. What they did, for example, this year is that they're distributing a lot more money to the lower, uh, lower placing teams at TI, and I think that is indirectly supporting the tier two scene as well because it might allow. So I'm talking about bigger bigger picture kind of thing here it might allow all teams that attended ti to participate in a four-month off season before the first major happens before the first dpc system tournament happens and you have tier two tournaments happening for the first four months and everybody in the tier two scene gets gets to enjoy these tournaments problem is that there's a lot of tier one teams uh who are I mean, a lot of these tier two tournaments uh, or other tournaments, B tournaments, that are asking tier one teams to to show up, like that they're only gonna want to do them if they have these tier one teams attend. So there needs to be more interest in the tier two scene, and that has to happen from everywhere, uh, not just Valve. It has to happen from everywhere. Um, but I do think something can be done. So we break the record next TI. We take one million from that. It's still record breaking, or. Mm-hmm. Even if it goes below the record, the record was made or something, and then you know we put some money ne- uh, to the tier two uh, tier two scene. Uh, but yeah, man, it's a, it's a it's a weird and funny thing. It has to be more defined because who's to stop a team from participating in any tournament that they want to? Uh, like, where's the limit? If do you have to be outside the DPC circuit to, uh, or like not in the top sixteen to participate in the tier two tournaments? Like, who's to stop? Liquid from or us from joining this tournament and just beating the shit out of uh, scary faces or whatever. Yeah, like, it's um, it's interesting because there's a there's a there's a big domino effect with what you're talking about because you're talking about how like why don't they put some of the money into the the scene or whatever? But the issue is like right now tournament organizers like third parties they don't really make money in Dota tournaments. That's just a fact, right? They don't make money, and then if you put cosmetics into like what they used to do for like these not battle passes yes. but like the compendiums if you do that it technically takes away from ti doing it because that's a once a year thing or oh my god like the fact that it's the only time of the year that you can get something like that is a big deal and that's why it breaks records i yes. mean you can argue that one way or the other go ahead Sin. i think that's i think that's a huge point here i feel like that's the that's like the biggest concern in a way is and probably what valve are thinking they're looking very much at diminishing returns right they're looking at we want ti to be the biggest event of the year the more of ti's value that you spread out throughout the year the less big ti will be right because the average person that plays dota has a disposable income of x and they will want to spend that much money on dota in a year and if yeah. you spread that out throughout the year, they're not going to spend $100 on the battle pass. Then they're going to spend 50 at TI. And suddenly the prize pool will be lower, right? So as long as TI is aiming to break its record every time, you've got to be careful with how much stuff you put throughout the year, right? Like for me, the, the idea that you said of, of supporting the tier two scene by having more integration into tournaments is great. And I personally am a huge believer in that. But I think what will end up happening is TI will be worth less. And then... That's the question yeah. if Valve will will eat that and accept that, right? Worth less, you not worthless. Wor- right? Yes, worth less money. Because we had, yeah. for example, our Captain's Draft tournament is the perfect example, Shannon, right? Ooh, we yeah. had our Captain's Draft tournament that reached a really high prize pool. Uh, I think we got, what was the prize pool? Like quarter million dollars for a tier two event online. Yeah. Um, did you guys win that, by the way, No, till I think you did. Oh, they did. Or did you play in it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you uh, guys won so. the first two, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, you yeah. played it. Um And that to us was a huge success. We had like sets that were amazing. The workshop artists made good money on it. We made good money on it. The teams made good money on it. It was like, it was like a a massive success. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after we couldn't get items with our tickets anymore. So it was gone. But those kind of tournaments, we could, we could fund. I I believe if we were given the tools we had back then, we could fund a tier two circuit. Actually, we could have done that. hundred percent. Shannon, if we wanted to. Yeah, uh, but the tools were taken away. But I that mean, would have cost. That would cost for TI, hundred percent. 
So it's about if you're willing to do that. Like, what's mm -hmm. the, what's the bigger thing for the game? Is it beating TI's record every year, or is it spreading the wealth, kind of, right? So, right. I mean, it's a it's a tough thing. I don't really know because I, I think it's I think it's important to first have a goal what you're aiming for. Like, what mm -hmm. is the tier two scene that we're trying to create? Are we trying to make them all millionaires? Are we trying to make them sustainable? Are we trying to make make it a hobby? Like, what level are we aiming at for the tier two scene? And then right. for the tier one scene, like we have to also define what happens. Like um, once you get once you get to a certain point, are you still allowed to attend uh, the tier two scene? Like if we're because Dota is so prize pool oriented, uh, much more than most games are, even sports games. Like if you if you're doing well in Dota, it, you're usually only doing well because you're winning tournaments. It's not because yeah. you signed yourself a nice sponsorship or anything. It's usually not how you how you make the money in Dota. Um, so it's a, the tier two scene is also suffering definitely because of the instability of Dota, like the uh, lack of professionalism when it comes to the circuit, uh, the expo like because it's been so unstable and volatile for for players that we don't know if we're attending, you know, the major because we have to play the qualifier. We lose the qualifier. We don't know if we're attending the minor because we have to qualify. We are qualified to the minor. We don't know if we're attending the major because we haven't won the minor. It's very hard for us to be set up in a boot camp somewhere where we can do our media content throughout the year for our organization that they're then going to sell to the sponsor that are then going to give more money to Dota, which is then going to boost our salary. So the tier two scene is probably suffering mostly because of that, because of a lack of a steady and predictable income so that they can't commit yep. fully to Dota. The tier one scene, we can probably do without winning a Dota tournament for a year. I mean, a lot of the teams can't. Like, uh, most of the teams that made it to TI, they should probably be set for the, for the year. Like, unless you have mm -hmm. really fucking expensive habits. And <laughs> what, is the, like, what does that mean for you then? Um, <laughs> Are you gonna still attend the tier two tournaments? Are they still allowed to? Like, it's just so much vagueness, so much gray area. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't freaking know. Like, but yeah, I get it. A lot of the tier two teams, they wish they could play Dota full time without worrying. I've been there too. It fucking sucks. And I think it's, <laughs> I don't really know. It's every people need to push for it. Uh, yeah, I could tweet about it. Yeah, I could push a little bit, but it's not really gonna help unless people find a way to also make it sustainable. And maybe we right. need help from Valve. Maybe we need help from somebody else. I, I'm not really sure how to do it. I'm I'm on holiday right now, man. <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> Fix all the problems, Peace out. bro. Jeez. Yeah, fuck <laughs> off. I'm out of here. Peace, God. No. Yeah, we're like, you, <laughs> you know, so you want to come on our podcast and talk a bit about Dota? Yeah, that'll be fun. Okay, please solve the economy, no tail. Yeah, solve oh, the economy yeah. of the tier two scene. Make it make it sustainable. <laughs> all right. ah. let's, that's cool. Let's let's move on, Shannon. Yeah, We've let's, talked this to death. Let's end the podcast with a. I don't even know if this is gonna be fun. I, I wanted to come up with a trivia. I don't. I don't know if this is going to be good, guys. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I was going to keep points, but who gives a shit? You're both winners, okay, before we get started. Yes. No Tail, this is for you. All Name right. a hero with a gender bender from Dota 1 to Dota 2. With a gender bender from Dota 1 to Dota 2. Who did that? Uh, I can give you a hint on what sex it was. If no. You okay. Wait, right. no hints. Me... This is a fierce competition here. <laughs> This is not dude, this it's is probably not tier two quiz. Ven Venomancer or Viper, but don't I'm not I'm not that's not a final answer. No, all right. I, I'll give you this isn't a hint per se. It's it's not anything weird. It's literally one sex to another. It's not like some weird creature. It's not dragon to worm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> if I oh, give you man. a hint, you will get less points even though we're not keeping track. Would you like the hint? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of system is this? Yes, please. I'll use my first hint here. All right. It is a female now. It was a male. I can give you one okay. more hint. Isn't this the only one, actually? It might be the only yeah, one. Yeah, I was thinking it's the only one. For some one. fucking reason, it's not coming to my head. <laughs> I think it's the only one. All right. All right next can hint? I give the second hint? I bet I bet I know what the second hint is. I know you would. Okay. Give go me ahead. the second hint. Give me the second hint. In Dota 1, it was riding a mount. That's right. <laughs> Dude, how come I don't know this one? All right, we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep giving you hints until you get it. All right, next hint: <laughs> strength hero. <laughs> Female strength hero. No tail. You can do this. Oh, legion commander. Legion there commander. you go. Right. Yes, that's the one. That's the I one. Was he rode a horse, that and he had great. a fat. <laughs> actually, it was a fat horse, obese horse, and he had a god tier yeah. mustache. Yeah, oh, I remember the that. Best. Yeah. All right, Cinderin. 
Even though okay. Notel actually spoiled this, I don't know if you were actually listening to him. This is a good test to see if you were. Oh. What was Notel known best for in Han when he played solo mid? What hero? If I had what to narrow it down. Single hero. One. Yeah, it's a single hero for me. It's like easily number one. I think Polywag Priest. Was that what it was? Wow. Called? You wow. actually Polywag. No, Polywag. Poly... <laughs> Polywag Priest, right? Polywag. 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 Oh. <laughs> That's, that's still one. That's Polywog one Priest, who was whatever. Rasta. Yes, a.k.a. Shadow yeah. Shaman. All right. I actually no knew tail. that before this interview. I've heard it before. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, okay. No Tail. Sindarin has won DreamHack twice. Name both teams and who they played. Uh, so MTW versus Navi. Okay. Um, 2012. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this other one was 2011, year before. Yeah, I remember that, but I... I the team <laughs> this one no, is hilarious the best team name of all time <laughs> wait were you on team shakira was that the one no 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 that was a french only i think i'll yeah. give you the initials because that doesn't really give it away uh w h b what <laughs> <laughs> what all right, they. I'll tell you, I don't. I don't freak they out. Played, close, actually. That's not bad. Before I give the name, I I couldn't look up this information. It didn't go back this far. It says you guys beat Fanatic. Was that No Tails Fanatic? No, that was no. A Ser- I, remember, I saw this live. It was a Serbian team. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was Serbian, Serbian Fanatic. Fanatic. I saw it. I saw it live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't remember the name. Like, what was the full name? Wild Honey Badgers. <laughs> Wild Honey Badgers. Oh right. <laughs> Dude, that's something I haven't heard in forever. Damn. Yeah, that's because okay. it's eight years ago that it was a name at all. All right, so. yeah, Cinderin, no, but I saw that live. I saw that, yeah. Right. Last question for Cinderin, and then I'm going to ask you both the same question just to see if you guys can get it. Cinderin, man, I, maybe you know this. This is maybe I'll give you easy shit. What was Zeus in Han? A, a horse, B, a gorilla, three, a beetle, or four? A, B, or three? What? A god like he is now. <laughs> what? It's horse, gorilla, beetle, a god. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because she said options A, B, three, and four. Like, yeah, you said A, B, point. three, and four. <laughs> yeah, you have to say A, B, three, or four, or else you get it incorrect. Okay, so what did you say? Horse, gorilla, beetle, or god? Yeah. I made this too easy, I think. I, th- I, I genuinely don't know. Oh, okay. But my best, something tells me it's gorilla, but that's... That's it. That's my Correct. guess. Correct. Man, you are. Okay. Mm, too but good. But I have Dude, never seen so this. Funny. I don't know why. <laughs> I've never seen this hero, but for some reason, it just comes to mind. I don't know. I, I couldn't draw it for you. I have no idea what it looks like. He has a, a freaking staff, and you should really... Do you remember how he thunderbolted Sh- Shannon? Wasn't it just like how this? He, like, yeah, yeah. He like, <laughs> no, but he, he like stretched his arm, and he like put it down, and then it was like really quick, like boom, like he fucking... And he's like a gorilla. Oh, yeah, it was super like, fast. <laughs> Yeah, that, that one made, a... in terms of the theme, made absolutely no sense. I don't understand what the, oh, yeah, the lore yeah, yeah. behind a fucking gorilla, but that's okay. Yeah, lightning, lightning gorilla. <laughs> All right, this one, maybe it's too easy. I don't know, because you guys did play a lot of Dota 1. There are, have been eight deleted items. Like, I'm not talking about an item that becomes something else. There have been eight in the history of Dota deleted items. Name four of them. Three should be very easy between the two of you. Okay, does this, is this Dota 1 and 2? Yes. Combined? Okay, oh. Ring of Aquila. Yeah, PMS. And okay, then... yeah. And the third one. Very easy. Sit there and say very easy one more time. Very oh easy. <laughs> no, tell. <laughs> A new uh, cosmetic with Bounty Hunter just came out recently where he's wielding it. Oh, yeah, it. Iron Talon. Iron okay, Talon. That's oh, yeah, the Iron Talon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Damn. Okay, now we're back in Dota 1, I think. Those are the only Dota yep, 2 items. That got that's deleted, correct. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Name one Shit, item. What do we have? Uh, I don't even remember. Wasn't there a Mystic Staff item, actually? Uh, does Ages of the Immortal count? No, it does not. Okay, because that used to be a purchasable item. Yeah. That got given to You Rose. could argue one of them is uh, an item that became something else, but it's like they never used the name again. It was an item in Han, actually. Wait, what? This is too hard. It's it's honestly crazy that this has been such a big part of our lives and we can't remember one out of five. <laughs> what? Well, it, this, nah, like when I, I was mean, looking at this... I don't this, remember any of the Dota deleted items. I, like I remember in, a lot of items that were changed and how they used to be built. The items... Did you know this, Shannon? Fun fact, the items that you build Octarine Core with now was the old recipe for Agonins in Dota 1. Yeah, I knew that, of course. Soul Booster and 
and you knew that. Yeah, of course. I used to buy AGs even back then, bro. I'm a fucking oh, obsessed. Man. Well, then you right. probably remember five the, items that were deleted then. The easiest answer of the five is <sighs> right, Arcane Ring. Too late. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Yeah, right. Okay, so oh, for yeah. people that don't know, Arcane, Arcane Ring was essentially Arcane Boots, but without the boots. As a yeah. um, Right. So they deleted that. And then the other four, if you guys are interested, which I had never heard of any somehow? of these. Just no, quickly, I've, give hints. I've never heard of these. Okay, so... Oh. Uh, all right, I'll tell you what makes them. This one is two Wraith Bands, Blade of Alacrity, and Quelling Blade. Oh, I know this one. It's the Impaler or something? It's something that you used to hit towers with. Correct. The Leveler. Uh, the Leveler. So you, leveler. you get siege damage one. to buildings and to non-hero units. That's a very interesting one that I feel like Sorla Khan could potentially have. Um, and then we okay. have... This one is Blades of Attack, Boots, and a Recipe, let's call it. That sounds like what phase boots would have been built with that time back then. This one you're not going to get. These are like, I've never heard of these. This is Sheds Sheds Cleaver. It gives a passive of 20% movement aura and 1 HP regen. So, a little strange. I don't remember ever seeing And the final one you're never going to get, I don't think. It's the old recipe, apparently. It was called Upgrader. 1500 gold recipe. They didn't have recipes back then. It was just called the Leveler. Or the Upgrader, sorry. And then, what? oh, sorry, there's one more. The final what one. What did it do? That's it. It's just a recipe. <laughs> Literally what? a recipe. Well, no fucking wonder they deleted it from the game. <laughs> no fucking wonder, yeah. <laughs> and then the final one is Leather Tunic. Oh. 950 gold for seven armor. Value? I actually kind of remember this item. Mm. existing so it was an in-between of chain mail and plate mail back then yeah pretty much and they both existed at that time i think yeah it's crazy because the i played dota one for a long time as well like 6.2 something probably and arcane rings the only one i've ever heard of so these other ones are very a lot of them are very all right that was a little too difficult arcane ring arcane ring all right, so we have finally come to a close on episode 21 of the We Say Things podcast. No Tail, our guest, our first ever guest. Thank you, friend. Thank you so much for being on here. Any any words you would like to give people that watch slash listen? Please solve uh, the economy before you leave. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'll fix it right here. I'll just uh, one text and uh, to Gabe Newell, and I'm Sick. sure nice. I'm sure it'll all be all right, guys. All will be fixed. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. It was, it was good. It was fun. Um, Always fun. And uh, yeah, to everyone, um, to all the fans who are making Dota possible, it's uh, it's an honor. It's an honor, you know, for the three of us to be here and uh, to be talking about history and about the game and all that. Like, this this thing spawned so much. Um, the whole MOBA genre has spawned so much shit. Like, wow. All the memes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's not forget the memes. Memes are the uh, most important. The Let's be real. Yep. All Sin the May Mays. Any final words for you? Thanks for all the memes, guys. Oh, have you watched In Bruges, <laughs> Cinderin? You. I forgot last week. Uh, no, I, I have not watched In Bruges. No, tell. have you ever seen the movie In Bruges? In Bruges? That sounds French. I don't think I've seen it. No. Trust me, you need to watch it. I'm, this Bruges. is not a meme. I'm telling you, find this movie. It's fucking amazing. Okay? Cinderin you know, just right. uses to watch it. can't look it up. The city yeah. is called Bruges. You know how to spell Bruges? From Bruges. Belgium? Yes, B-R-O-G. B R U G E S in Bruges. Oh. Watch it. You guys are gonna love oh, it. I in promise. Bruges. Yes. Okay, okay. In Bruges. Okay, okay. Exactly. So anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Remember, the podcast can be found on the YouTube channel Dota Cinema or through any audio channels via Google Podcasts, Apple if you're an Apple person for some reason, uh, Spotify, and all the rest. Thank you again to No Tail, the two-time TI winner, four major. Actually, of the twelve events that Valve has hosted that are three million or more, you've won half. That's fucking disgusting, dude. You disgust me yeah, on a level off. that I... <laughs> Very disgusting. Anyway, thanks for watching. Games, bro. <laughs> Again, guys. Until next time, Suns fan, No Tail, and Cinder and signing out. Enjoy the outro. We say things that don't mean anything But thanks for listening Yeah.